Okay, I think that everybody is already seated, so welcome. I was welcoming people in the morning, but I should welcome Karel Janicek here, who came. That's marvelous, because he doesn't have much time. So <laughs> he started with all this foundation neuron and, and uh, all this support. So, but I am welcoming all other people. I think that I welcomed most uh, in the morning. But of course, I am again repeating myself from the morning. So most cordial welcome to Martin Rees. He rejected or objected very much yesterday evening that I should call him Lord, etc. because he said, when I'm outside of England, I am just Martin, Martin Rees. But in any case, it's very complicated to enumerate all functions which he got, but it's quite remarkable. Uh, he was five years president of Royal Society from 2005 to 2010. Uh, uh, he um, got many prizes, Einstein Prize in Zurich, Templeton Prize, uh, he got uh, uh, well, I mean, he's honorary doctorate of many universities. He's actually also honorary foreign member of our learned society. He was for many years uh, master of Trinity College, but you didn't make uh, Trinity College richer than what is the author of Harry, Poppins, uh, Harry Potter, or did you? You are richer or you are not so rich? As author, not so rich. Because I remember that Trinity College was claimed to be on the third place after Queen, after whatever, Bank of England, etc. But now it got poorer after such authors like uh, uh, author of Harry Potter. Well, in any case, Martin, I should say actually something which is more personal and which is more uh, associated with former Czechoslovakia, with communistic Czechoslovakia. I met Martin, as he mentioned today morning, in America, it was just after 69, when it was still possible in the last moments to get out. And, uh, and then he sent to me invitation in 75, 77, and I could get actually out in 79. I was in Cambridge, but I'm not at all saying this because of me and because of boasting, but what he did then is that I recommended to him about six, seven people whom he should invite, my students, my colleagues, also observational students, and, and he did it as uh, the director of Institute of Astronomy. So that was another function which he was, director of Institute of Astronomy. Uh, well, in any case, I will not uh, longer speak about Martin, and uh, he will tell us today a general talk, uh, which is called From Mars to Multiverse, and because there are so many witnesses, so I will say what you told me yesterday evening, that the talk is full of pictures, but that he said, but I will write something for you. So we are looking forward to what you will write. <laughs> Martin. Can someone put the... Uh Video on. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, talking to this audience. Um, and uh, my topic is a rather broad one, as you can see. Um, and uh, uh, I'd like to start off by reminding everyone that astronomy is really a fundamental science, but it's also the grandest environmental science because the one part of the human environment has been shared by all humans throughout history, everywhere in the world, is the night sky. They've all looked up at it, they've interpreted it in their own way, and it's something we all have in common. And I'm going to tell you something about uh, recent discoveries about it. But let's go back for some history. We're here in Prague, and we associate Prague with Kepler, and with Tycho, two of the people who made astronomy a real mathematical science. The third person who did this was Isaac Newton, and uh, he never came to Prague. In fact, I don't think he ever left England. Uh, uh, but he um, uh, was the best student ever at Trinity College, which is Victor Trinity College, which uh, Yuzi Bichak just mentioned. And it was uh, uh, Newton who, of course, told us that the force that makes the apple fall is the force that holds the planets in their orbits. That was the first unification in science. He invented uh, the first reflecting telescope with a four-inch mirror. But he also must have thought about space travel. This is a famous illustration from his classic book. It shows 
as you can see, a cannonball being fired from a mountain top. And if the cannonball is fired fast enough, then it curves downwards in its trajectory no more steeply than the Earth curves away underneath it. It goes into orbit. And Newton calculated that to go into that circular orbit, the cannonball has to go at 25,000 kilometers per hour. Far beyond, of course, what was possible for the cannon of his time. And again, as I'm sure you all know, it wasn't until 1957 that the first man-made object went into orbit. This was the uh, Soviet Sputnik, and this was followed four years later by the first person to go into orbit, uh, Yuri Gagarin. And space exploration then proceeded at a very high rate, and only seven years after Gagarin, we had this picture, still iconic among environmentalists, showing the uh, Earth with its delicate blue biosphere, contrasted with the sterile moonscape on which Neil Armstrong in 1969 placed his footprints. And I cherish this picture signed for me a few years ago uh, by uh, uh, seven of the Apollo astronauts uh, who'd been to the moon. Of course, the last people on the moon returned in 1973, more than 40 years ago. So most people in this audience here are too young to remember when men walked on the moon, which is slightly incongruous because uh, I'm old enough to have grown up thinking of this as a futuristic event, whereas to some of you here, it's ancient history, just like the uh, Egyptians built pyramids and the Americans sent men to the moon. They both see rather strange uh, national goals. And of course, People were sent to the moon as a display of American power to beat the Russians, not for any scientific reason. And since that time, no one's been back to the moon, though many hundreds have orbited the Earth in low orbit, many in the International Space Station, shown here. But space technology has, of course, proceeded apace. We depend on it every day for, uh, for sat-nav communications, environmental monitoring, weather forecasting, all those things. And for science, it's been important because telescopes in space get above the blurring and absorption effect of the Earth's atmosphere. And unmanned probes have been to all the other main bodies in our solar system sending back close-up pictures of varied and distinctive worlds. And I'll give, give you a quick tour through our solar system. Well, if you went there, you'd be launched off in a rocket like this. And when you'd got about 10 million kilometers away from the Earth, heading outwards, if you look back, you'd see something like this. <coughs> Earth and moon with the sun shining from the right. Then you would get to Mars, the red planet, and many probes have been to Mars, orbiting it or landing on it. Here's pictures of Mars's surface taken by ESA's Mars Express. This is a gorge several miles deep. And two years ago, uh, this American probe called Curiosity, which is about the size of a small car, uh, was uh, landed in a great technical feat on the surface of Mars, and it has been trundling across the surface for the last uh, couple of years, um, taking geological samples. It landed in the top left, where that little uh, ellipse is, and it's going to explore this huge crater, which is about 100 kilometers across. And it's already traversed about uh, 30 uh, kilometers, not very clear here, but you can see along the bottom, those are the tracks made by uh, the Curiosity as it's been moving across the surface of Mars. And this is a picture it took, and you can see geological strata on the side of the crater here, and you can understand why it just has interest to explore uh, what's, what's out there. Well, going beyond Mars, the next planet you come to is Jupiter, the giant of our solar system, 
which has uh, the four uh, uh, moons which were first discovered by Galileo uh, in 1611. Um, and we've had close-up pictures of these, and they're very varied. This is Io, which is sulfurous and volcanic. This is Europa, which in contrast is covered in ice. And here's a close-up of some of the ice on the surface of Europa. It's been obviously melted and re-solidified many times. And there's probably uh, some, uh, uh, some liquid underneath it. And when you get beyond Jupiter, you get to Saturn with its rings. And the Cassini spacecraft has, for the last five years, been orbiting around Saturn, taking close-up pictures of its various moons. This is a particularly nice picture. Um, this is um, uh, an eclipse of the Sun by Saturn. Cassini took this picture when it was beyond Saturn, lined up with Saturn and the Sun, and at a distance such that the disk of Saturn just blocked out the Sun. So you see the rings still in sunlight, but the, uh, the Sun is blocked out. And although it's rather hard to see here, that's the Earth where the arrow is a long way away. Uh, it takes uh, several hours for a radio signal to get from the Earth out to Saturn. But the uh, Cassini spacecraft carried in its cargo bay a small American robotic craft called Huygens, which was supposed to land on Titan, a giant moon of Saturn. And it was supposed to do what's shown in this artist's impression. Titan was known to have an atmosphere. It was supposed to open a parachute and land. And it did. And this is a remarkable feat, because it's not controlled directly from Earth, because the, light, the radio signal takes hours to get there. So it was on its own. It was uh, launched from Cassini, and it had to find its way to uh, uh, Titan and uh, open its parachute. And it did. Pictures on the left and the center were taken on the way down. The right-hand picture shows where it landed. Now, this may look rather nice, rivers and a little lake, but the rivers are liquid methane, and the temperature is about minus 160 degrees centigrade, so not a comfortable place to live. And this is another rather false color picture uh, showing some of the little lakes of methane or ethane on the surface of Titan. And so it's wonderful that we have pictures like this. And this is a smaller moon of Saturn called Enceladus, uh, which has an icy surface rather like Europa. And by very careful measurements, um, we know that there is a deep ocean under one part of this. We know that because the uh, trajectory of Cassini was monitored very closely as it passed uh, by Enceladus, and a gravity anomaly was detected, indicating a region of low density on one side. So there is certainly water underneath the uh, uh, ice of Enceladus, and probably Europa too. Now, another uh, uh, thing that was in the headlines this year was the European Space Agency's uh, Rosetta probe, which uh, uh, went by this rather complicated trajectory out beyond Jupiter and uh, orbited alongside a comet. And then it uh, took close-up pictures of this uh, rather strange comet. And then it launched this uh, small uh, um, craft, which actually landed on the surface of the comet. And this is one leg of the, of the lander. And the Rosetta probe is still following the comet. Uh, and it may break up into two. You see, it looks as, a, as though it's rather fragile. It may break up into two. And what will certainly happen is that as the comet gets closer to the sun, it'll start uh, uh, getting hot, and it may reactivate the batteries of the lander, and we'll see gas spewing out and the tail forming. So there's a lot more to come from Rosetta. Well, in the next 50 years, I would predict that all the bodies in our solar system will be mapped in detail by huge numbers, huge flotillas of robotic fabricators. Maybe little tiny ones, no bigger than iPhones. They'll be sent out uh, to uh, gather data, and uh, we'll learn a great deal about all these planets. 
But will people follow? This is a picture of Harrison Schmidt, the last man on the moon in uh, 1972. He was a geologist. He spent two or three days gathering uh, about uh, 200 kilograms of moon, moon rock um, and uh, came back. And of course, uh, the Curiosity probe uh, may miss some things on Mars, which a trained geologist like Schmidt could have uh, uh, found. But of course, sending a geologist to Mars is much more expensive, especially if they want to be brought back at the end of the mission. It costs much more. Um, so uh, I personally think that the practical case for sending people into space is getting weaker all the time as robotics and miniaturization get better. But nonetheless, I think there is a future for space flight by humans as an adventure and a sort of dangerous sport. And I think the first people who will go into space uh, will probably be privately funded adventurers who will be prepared to take much higher risks than NASA or ESA are prepared to impose on civilians who are government supported. The American space program, the shuttle, was hugely expensive because they were so risk averse. It failed twice in 135 launches. Each of those failures was a huge national trauma. They need to launch people who are prepared to take big risks. And as you probably know, uh, there are um, American foundations, in particular the one run by Elon Musk called SpaceX, uh, which are um, soon going to be able to launch people into Earth orbit. The next thing they will do is launch people into an orbit, not to land on the moon, but to go around the backside of the moon and come back. That's a five-day trip taking you further away from the Earth than any human beings ever been before. And I'm told there's a volunteer for the second trip, but not yet for the first trip. And that may tell you something about the uh, expected dangers. Uh, what about going to Mars? Uh, well, um, uh, there's been a proposal to go to Mars and go around it and come back without landing. That would take about 500 days. And the uh, idea of crew there is a middle-aged, stable couple who could stand being cooped up together for 500 days. Um, the alternative is the one-way trip to uh, go to Mars and uh, live out your days there. And uh, uh, there are volunteers for that too. And uh, Elon Musk has himself said that he hopes to die on Mars, but not on impact. And uh, he is now, I think, 43 years old. And so if he lives to be 80, I can imagine he may well be able to do that. Now, humans will, I think, 100 years from now, have established small colonies independent of the Earth. Um, and uh, uh, I think that would be the start of the post-human era. Because once they're out there in that alien environment, they want to use all the technology of genetics and cyborgs and computers to modify themselves to that alien environment. They'll have tremendous pressure to adapt. And so soon, there'll be a different species from us. And this is the start of the post-human era. But it's important that going into space is going to be an adventure, not routine. And it's a really dangerous heresy to say that there could be mass emigration and that we can avoid human problems on Earth by evacuating. We can't. There's nowhere in space as comfortable as even the top of Everest or the North or South Poles. So we have to solve our problems on Earth, but we should cheer along these crazy adventurers who want to go into space and hope that we'll have all these uh, robots which will explore the uh, solar system and probably quite soon uh, create huge robotic fabricators to make huge structures in space and maybe on the moon as well without needing humans. Now, is there any life out there already before humans go? Uh, we know there's no very advanced life in our solar system. People have speculated about the possibility of life on comets um, or maybe under the ice of Europa or Enceladus um, or maybe even on Mars. But if you want more interesting life, then we have to go beyond our solar system to the realm of the stars. And one of the most exciting developments in the last decade or two in astronomy has been the realization that the stars you see 
on a dark night are not just twinkling points of light. Nearly all of them are orbited by a retinue of planets, just as our sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. The evidence for this has come from two very simple techniques, and I want to mention them both. They're both indirect. They look at the star, not the planet. One of them is displayed here. If a planet is orbiting a star, then actually both the star and the planet orbit around the center of mass of the system, what's called the barycenter. The planet goes around in a big orbit, and the star, being much heavier, goes around in a much smaller orbit. It's like a very asymmetrical dumbbell. But by very careful spectroscopic measurements of the star, you can detect the small change in its Doppler below it is, it is Doppler effect as it goes around this circle. And this is an example of a, a successive measurements of a, of a star. Um, and this indicates, it's a sine wave indicating that it's going around in a circular orbit. And the amplitude of this is about uh, 10 meters per second. And this technique is able to get down to uh, uh, just a few meters per second walking pace for the motion of this star. But even that is not good enough to detect a planet like the Earth. This technique has detected several hundred planets, but they're mainly the size of Jupiter or Saturn, the giants of our solar system. Planets like the Earth would induce motions of only about a centimeter per second in their parent star, and that's too small to be detected. But another technique does allow this, and this again is very simple in principle, it's transits. Suppose you were looking at the solar system from a long way away and you were in the plane of the orbit. Then when the Earth moved across in front of the Sun, then the Sun would look slightly fainter. The Sun's brightness would dip. And since the Earth has about 1% of the diameter of the Sun, that's one part in 10,000 of its area, then the dip would be about one part in 10,000. And every time it came round, you would see the same dip. So a signature of the planet is regular dips. And a spacecraft named after Kepler spent three and a half years observing a patch of sky about seven degrees across and measuring the brightness of over 100,000 stars in that part of the sky, measuring that brightness of each star to a precision of one part in 100,000. Doing this over and over again, once every hour or more for each star, looking for just these effects. And of course, if you find uh, a planet by this method, of course you're only finding this subset which uh, um, have orbital planes in our line of sight, uh, but you can infer two things. You can infer the length of the year on that planet from how often it comes round, and you can infer the size of the planet from how deep the uh, uh, the dip is, because that's the ratio of the area of the planet to the area of the star. And Kepler has found evidence for several thousand planets. And this is just a sort of joke picture which, uh, uh, which, which shows to scale the um, uh, lots of the systems it's found, and you can find their, their mass and their radius. But special interest attaches to planets which seem to be twins of our Earth. Twins in two respects. They would have the same uh, size as the Earth, and also, more important, be at a distance from their star such that water could exist. Not so close that water boils away, nor so far away that the water is always frozen. And there are a few cases like that. And this picture shows one. At the, t at the bottom, it shows our solar system, at the top, it shows the same scale, a system found by Kepler, where there are five planets. And it's a small system because the star that they're orbiting is about half the mass of the sun and about 10 times fainter. So they're all close in. But the outermost of these five planets is in what's called a habitable zone. It's a planet the size of the Earth where water could exist. And this is one of the two or three best candidates so far uh, where there might be uh, um, a possible biosphere. Well, these two techniques have been very fruitful, but
but they are both indirect. They infer the planet by looking at the star. But of course, we'd really like to see the stars uh, and, and the planets around them so that we could see the planets directly, not just their shadows, as it were. And that's hard. To, to see how hard, uh, let's imagine that uh, you were an alien on a planet, say, 30 light years away, looking at our solar system. And suppose you had a big telescope. Then the sun would look to you like an ordinary star. And the Earth would look, in Carl Sagan's phrase, like a pale blue dot lying very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and millions of times fainter. Indeed, two billion times fainter. But if the aliens had a big enough telescope to observe that pale blue dot carefully, they could learn quite a bit about it. The shade of blue would be slightly different, depending on whether the Pacific Ocean <coughs> or the landmass of Asia was facing them. So you could infer that there were continents and oceans and the length of the day. You could probably infer something about the climate and the seasons. Maybe even by taking the spectrum that there was evidence for a biosphere. Well, we can't do that yet. This is the best telescope in the world, the European Southern Observatory's array of four, eight meters. This isn't quite good enough, but the Europeans are planning, as many of you probably know, um, the uh, um, Extremely Large Telescope. It's not a very original name, it's the ELT, um, and uh, this is uh, being planned, um, and uh, they've uh, leveled a mountain top in Chile where it's going to go, and it'll be finished in about 10 years. And this has a mirror which is 39 meters across. Now that's probably about twice the, the width of this room. This room is probably 20 meters across. So it's a huge uh, mirror, not one sheet of glass, but a mosaic of 800 pieces of glass. But this instrument, with uh, high spectroscopy resolution <coughs> added to it, will be able to study Earth-like planets around the nearest stars and do for us what the aliens uh, were, were, were doing in my imaginary uh, story. And this will be really, really exciting. But do we expect life on any of these distant worlds? Um, this is a biological question, um, not, uh, not, not a physical question, and it's much difficult because we don't know exactly how life began on the Earth. Uh, we know about Darwinian evolution, but we don't know what caused the transition from biochemistry to the first uh, replicating, metabolizing systems. So we don't know whether the origin of life on Earth was a rare fluke, or happened anywhere, nor do we know whether the chemical basis of life on Earth is going to be the same elsewhere. But this is going to be a very exciting subject in the coming decades. Now, a word about the stars. We're not surprised that there are planetary systems, although we didn't know they existed until um, less than 20 years ago, um, because of this cartoon. A star forms by uh, a dusty cloud of gas in the interstellar medium contracting under its own gravity. And if it's spinning even very slowly, as it contracts, it will spin faster, like the ballerina spinning up when she pulls in her arms. And around the protostar will form a dusty disk, and the dust will agglomerate into rocks and then into planets. And this is a generic process, so we expected, even more than 20 years ago, that planets of some kind would be common around stars. And we do see evidence for stars forming now. Stars are forming in the Eagle Nebula here, 7,000 light years away. And we also see stars dying. This is what the sun will look like in five billion years in the future. It'll flare up, losing a lot of mass, and leaving a white dwarf behind. Here's another dying star. The life cycle of stars is fairly well understood, and stars which are heavier than the sun, say 10 times as heavy, they burn up their fuel more rapidly, and they end their lives in a more exciting way. And this is uh, probably, as you know here, the Crab Nebula, one of the best known objects in the sky, 
which is the expanding debris from a supernova explosion witnessed by Chinese astronomers nearly a thousand years ago. In the year 1054 AD, the Chinese court astronomer, I don't know if anyone reads Chinese here, but uh, um, this uh, says that a guest star appeared, became brighter than the moon, and faded away after a few weeks. And at that point in the sky, we now see this. Now, you might think that these supernovae are far away and long ago and irrelevant to us on Earth. But, in fact, we wouldn't be here were it not for supernovae, as was first realized by this man, Fred Hoyle, in Cambridge. He noted that if you were to take a slice through a big star just before it faced its crisis and run out of fuel, it would have a sort of onion skin structure where it would have hydrogen and helium in the outer layers, but the inner layers were processed by nuclear fusion further up the periodic table. There'd be a layer of carbon and oxygen, then neon, and then iron, and so on. And then when it explodes, all this debris is flung out, as in the Crab Nebula, and then mixes with the interstellar medium, and then new stars will form from interstellar gas contaminated by debris from these explosions. And so the wonderful story is that uh, all the atoms of which we are made were forged in ancient stars which lived and died long before the solar system formed. Indeed, each of us has inside us uh, atoms from many hundred different stars all across our galaxy. And this story can explain why oxygen is common, why gold and uranium are rare, and how they came to be in our solar system. And uh, uh, the people who did it with Fred Hoyer were Fowler and Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage. There's a picture of them there. Well, I've talked so far about stars in our galaxy, our Milky Way, which is a big disk like that, and contains about 100 billion stars, and we now know probably maybe many, many millions of planets like the Earth. But we know that this is, is just one galaxy among uh, billions of others. If we could get two million light years away from the Earth and look back at our galaxy, we'd see something like this. This, of course, is Andromeda, our nearest big neighbor in space. It's a disk galaxy viewed obliquely, where you've got, again, 100 billion stars orbiting around some central hub in which there lurks a big black hole. And this is really rather like our own galaxy. And galaxies, of course, are the basic units of the large-scale universe. Here's another one, the so-called Whirlpool Galaxy. Well, you may think it's going to be rather hard for us to actually understand anything about galaxies, because we can't do experiments on them, and they are huge, and in fact the uh, orbital time for the stars to go around the center is about 100 million years, so nothing happened in our lifetime. But we can do experiments in the virtual world of our computer. We can ask what would happen if two galaxies crashed together. We can put in the gravity and the dynamics and we can come up with, with something like this. This shows two galaxies falling together and a sort of train wreck and eventually it settles down into, into one uh, uh, amorphous galaxy. And I should warn you that the Andromeda galaxy is going to collide with our galaxy in about four billion years. That's four billion years. Um, but we do see in space systems like this. This is a real picture of two galaxies. And having done simulations like I showed you, one can infer that what happened here is two galaxies have got dangerous and one has pulled out a tidal plume on the other and if we came back in 100 million years, probably these two would have merged. And so this is a common process. And this is an example of how numerical simulations have allowed us to um, learn a huge amount about galaxies. And I, and I just skipped over earlier um, a picture. This shows a survey of all the galaxies within 500 million light years of us. They're grouped together in clusters. But there's one important thing we know about the universe in a large scale which was first discovered by Edwin Hubble, uh, uh, astronomer shown here. He was a heavy smoker there, as you can see. And uh, he showed that um, 
the galaxies are moving away from us, and the further away they are, the faster they're moving, as indicated by the longer arrows further out. Now, at first sight, you might think this implies we're in some special central position, but it doesn't, as I can illustrate by this example. Imagine this is a lattice. It could be an infinite lattice. And supposing that all the rods lengthen, then if you sit on one of the vertices, you'll see the other vertices moving away at a speed proportional to the number of intervening licks. You see the whole thing expanding. And this is quite a good model for the expanding universe. If you imagine the galaxies linked together, or the clusters linked together by rods, and imagine all the rods expanding at the same rate. So there's no particular central galaxy. Everyone sees the same universal expansion around them. There's one feature which is not displayed by this particular metaphor, better by this one. This is another Escher picture, uh, angels and devils. <coughs> because when you look a long way away in, into the universe, you see a long time back into the past. And you look back, therefore, to a time when the rods were shorter and things were packed closer together. So what you will actually see on what's called your past light cone is something more like this, when as you go back in the past, go further out, things get closer together. And we can look very far back. This is a picture which shows a tiny patch of sky, a few half minutes across. It would take a hundred patches like this to cover the full moon. And in this little patch with a small telescope, you'd see nothing. But with a big telescope, you see hundreds of smudges. Each of these is a galaxy, many fully the equal of our galaxy or the Andromeda galaxy, but looking so small and faint because of their huge distances. And uh, some of them are so far away, their light set out when the galaxies had only recently formed. And just as a slightly technical <coughs> picture, um, the object seen there um, is one of the most distant objects we know. Um, and uh, um, this shows its, its spectrum, if you, the spectrum of the light from it, um, and uh, um, the tracing of the visible light. And uh, I show this for the physicists in the audience that uh, um, the strongest line in the hydrogen spectrum is Lyman alpha, normally in the far ultraviolet at 1216 angstroms. But here, Lyman alpha is um, at uh, 10,000 angstroms. It's stretched by a factor of eight between emission and reception, and this is a consequence of the uh, expansion of the, of the universe. So we can look very far back to when the universe was young. But what about still earlier eras, before any galaxies formed? Here we do have some clues, and the, and the best clue, which you probably have also heard about, was discovered by these people, Pengis and Wilson, exactly 50 years ago. We're having a celebration conference next month about this. They discovered that intergalactic space wasn't completely cold. It was full of microwaves coming from all directions with a temperature of about three degrees above absolute zero. And future measurements since then have shown that if you measure this radiation at different frequencies, it uh, has an exact thermal black body spectrum. So the idea here is that the universe was once very hot and dense hotter and denser than the inside of a star, and as it expanded and cooled, this radiation cooled down, from the UV to the visible, the infrared, it's now just microwaves, but it fills the universe, it's got nowhere else to go. And this is a relic, an afterglow of the hot, dense beginning of our universe. Now, when people are told this, they somehow uh, are puzzled, because uh, they're told that we have this time chart for the evolution of the universe, starting with something very hot and dense at the beginning, uh, and uh, cooling down. Um, and uh, these are the various key events. I don't have time to go into them. But they are puzzled because many of them know the second law of thermodynamics, which says that normally structure gets washed out uh, during expansion. But here we're being told that the universe started off almost entirely smooth and uniform, and then as it expanded, it developed the stars and galaxies and the structures. That's not paradoxical, it's the effect of gravity. What gravity does is, as the universe expands, if there's a region that's just a tiny bit denser than the outside, then that bit will decelerate more. And the contrast will grow and it'll condense out. And I'll show you here, this is a picture showing a part of the universe where the expansion is, is subtracted out and you see the structure develops. 
pattern here that's in billions of years, um, and it starts off almost uniform, and uh, the structure develops. And this other picture that you watch will show the same, show the same thing, rather rather more slowly. Um, but uh, uh, and this picture shows separately the dark matter in blue um, and the uh, atoms in red, which make the stars. And this shows how initial small density contrasts on the action of gravity uh, develop uh, and enhance in concentration. And this is how galaxies form. Well, the time chart I showed earlier allows us to connect our present universe with a very early stage, when the universe is very hot and dense. But it still leaves open unanswered questions. We want to know what caused the fluctuations, because in order for that story to work, there must be some fluctuations in the universe. Why does the universe expand the way that it does? Why does it contain the observed mixture of atoms and radiation and dark matter? Well, the answer to those questions is not very well known. I put up this hazard sign now. Uh, it's uncertain. Um, and uh, uh, the answer lies in the very, very early part of the universe when we don't understand the physics. I like the picture here, which was the cover of a popular science magazine, which shows the very early universe. And that says actual size. So we're talking about a time when the entire universe was squeezed literally to the size of a, a tennis ball. And the physics at that time is very uncertain. And we're going back to a time when the universe was uh, 10 to minus 36 seconds old. But although this may sound crazy, there are serious theories which tell us about what the universe was like uh, back, at, back at that time, and which do allow us to understand how quantum fluctuations in a very small universe gave rise to the fluctuations which are now spread across the sky and give rise to galaxies. How much longer do I have? Five? Yeah, sure. Five, five minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So I, I'm going to uh, I'm, going, I'm going to clip, just skip over a lot of things. I'm going to skip over the multiverse. You can ask me about the multiverse. Uh, uh, yes. Well, I will show this. This is Kepler um, because one of the key. Uh, issues is, um, was our Big Bang the only one? With the aftermath of the Big Bang, was it the only one? And if there were many Big Bangs, were they all the same, governed by the same physical laws, or were they different? And this is very important for understanding why the universe was the way, is the way it is, and why it is so <coughs> conducive to the emergence of complexity and life. If there's just one universe, then we just accept it as it is. If there are many universes, many Big Bangs, and they're governed by different laws, then of course there'll be a variety and only some of them will allow complexity to evolve. And we'll be in one of those. And it's one of the most important questions to settle which part of this decision tree is right. When we understand the Big Bang better, we know if the Big Bang was unique. When we understand the physical laws better, through string theory or something like that, we will understand whether, uh, whether, whether all the laws are the same or whether in some universes gravity might have been stronger or weaker. If I were to have an icon or a logo for my research area, I'd pick this. This is an Ouroboros, a snake eating his tail. It indicates the links between the very small and the very large. The very small is on the left, and that's the domain of quantum theory, the everyday scale at the bottom, and the scale of astronomy on the right. The left-hand side is the domain of the quantum world, and we can ignore gravity. Chemists ignore the gravitational pull between different atoms in a molecule, because they're so weak. On the right-hand side, it's the domain of gravity, we can ignore quantum theory because the planets are so big that the quantum fuzziness in the orbit of a planet can be ignored. But if you want to understand the very beginning of the universe, when the entire universe was squeezed to microscopic size, then we need the unification symbolized, as it were, gastronomically at the top of this, di this diagram. We need to unify gravity <coughs> with the quantum principle. And this is, of course, the theory that's still being searched for. 
and we, uh, until we have it, we won't fully understand the very beginning of the universe. Before leaving this picture, let me mention that we have the frontier of the very small on the left, the very large on the right. But most scientists, 99% of them, are neither cosmologists nor particle physicists. They work on a third frontier, the frontier of the very complicated things at the bottom. And uh, just as a bit, of, uh, um, a bit of modesty, it's important to say that the stars and the atoms are easier to understand than anything that's alive. And this is a picture of a flea, and this is a, some of you may know, this is a, uh, the flea drawn by uh, Robert Hooke, who was uh, Newton's least favorite colleague, who had an early microscope and drew wonderfully. And uh, uh, this indicates that even a small insect has layer upon layer of complexity, far harder to understand than either a star or a galaxy. So the main challenge, which is where 99% of scientists work, is the challenge of complexity, especially among things that are alive. Well, finally, uh, I want to come back uh, to the Earth uh, and uh, uh, make one point which I'm often asked. I'm often asked, does the fact that I'm an astronomer make me think any differently about everyday problems of this Earth? And I have to say, I've lived among astronomers and they uh, are no more serene than everyone else. They fret just as much about what's going to happen tomorrow as anyone else. But I think there is one respect in which astronomy does change your perspective. And that's by giving you an awareness of the far future. And let me explain. Most people, unless they live in uh, Kansas or parts of the Muslim world, are familiar with the fact that we are the outcome of four billion years of Darwinian evolution. They're familiar with a time chart, something like this. But even people familiar with this often somehow feel that we humans are the culmination of it. But no astronomer can believe that. Because astronomers know that our sun has been shining for four and a half billion years. This is a sort of our depiction for a cloud and sort of time lapse has got there. So it should be another five or six billion before it flares up engulfing the inner planets. It's less than halfway through its life. So, that doesn't mean that we can be the culmination. Future evolution, here on Earth and far beyond, could be far more wonderful than what's happened up till now. And any creatures sending this postcard, when the sun explodes, they'll be as different from us as we are from a buck, because there's more time between now and then than has elapsed through the whole course of biological evolution. And that's, therefore, um, why we should uh, be open-minded about the future. Probably it'll be silicon-based, not organic, uh, but we don't know what will happen. And in that Darwin himself was aware that uh, pheasant species would not survive unaltered into the future. This is a quote from his work. But of course, future evolution is going to be faster than Darwinian selection. It's going to be on a technological time scale of genetic modification and machines building even better machines. So it'll be even more exciting. But my really final word is this. Even in this huge perspective, stretching 45 million centuries into the past and more into the future, this century is special because it's the first where one species, namely ours, has had the Earth's future in his hands. And so what happens this century will foreclose or allow all those future developments. And this is the first century where one species has had control. And that's an important point to perhaps end on, that uh, this Earth that we're living on, a special pale blue dot in the cosmos, is special. And perhaps we're on it at a special time. Thank you very much. On too long as yet. No, 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 it's good. Okay. okay, well, thank you very much indeed, yeah. Martin, for this wonderful lecture. You see, I forgot one thing to admire uh, Martin's many roles. And one of his roles is that he's, he's astronomer royal. 
from 1992, or I don't know. But in any case, you saw at least how Martin teaches Queen Elizabeth the astronomy. <laughs> it was beautifully pedagogical and very interesting. I also remember when you spoke about, uh, this is picture, this is slightly what we are like to do, but he would not join it together, he would do just universe, mm -hmm. and, and then the, the observer would give reality to, know, yeah. to, to the Big Bang. But, uh, but also what I recalled is when you spoke about unity of gravity and quantum gravity, etc. I once quoted to Martin Josef Čapek, and Josef Čapek says, dotýká se jednoty světa si dotkán k pravdějšímu jednání. Josef Čapek was the brother of Karel Čapek, and he said, touching the unity of word, you are forced to more moral action. And you said, you think that as scientists are more moral? No, not at all. And <laughs> so, you know, okay, so I think that we have time for about two questions. Please, Karel Čapek. Yes. I would like uh, to ask you, uh, you can form uh, some kind of stable universes, but would be like for a range for a uh, have an idea what the ranges are, and I was wondering if roughly maybe what the range might be for, uh, or also uh, where we are on the range. So for example, time constant that our universe would be on the range of acceptable universes. Uh, well, I think, I think no one can really answer that question, because uh, um, we, we can imagine universes which could be sort of sterile or stillborn, because uh, the laws don't allow complexity. Um, and all we can say is that if we had a theory which said that there were many universes and they were governed by different laws, and if you could put some probability measure on those laws, we could then say, are we in a typical member of the subset which allows us to exist? But we're very far from being able to do that. But of course, that's the kind of thing we'd like to do eventually, to, uh, to, uh, if there are um, many possible physical laws, we want to show that we are perhaps not in a typical universe, but to see if we're in a typical member of the subset which allows complexity. Uh, okay. There, yeah. Well, you have shown up an image on which you were uh, providing an evidence for many big bang and Yes. Happened. Uh, I just missed one another. Which would be none uh, because there are a lot of heretics who are from the evangelist. So, so, would you mind to comment on such a heresy or what is it? Oh, I see. Um, well, uh, I think there's very good evidence indeed for tracing back to a stage when the universe was at a temperature of 10 billion degrees and was uh, uh, hotter and denser than the star. We have very good evidence for that. Um, and uh, I would say that that evidence is as convincing as anything a geologist would tell you about the history of the Earth. We have fossils, the proportions of helium, hydrogen, deuterium, and lots of other evidence about structure forming. So back to one second, I would say that uh, um, there is, uh, it would not be reasonable to doubt the hot big bang. But when we get back still further, then of course the physics becomes more extreme higher energies and higher densities, and we have less confidence in the physics and fewer direct fossils. So I would say back to one second, I would say it's as well established as anything in geophysics. Um, but uh, there are strong indications that we can say something about a much, much earlier stage, the inflationary stage, but that's not so definite. But uh, I think the um, evidence that 13.8 billion years ago, everything was in a hot, dense state is completely compelling now. So what this is what you call ago, Big Bang, actually. Okay. This is what you call Big Bang. You know, the point is that I'm not sure if Vlado Spirko was probably not here three years ago, Abai Ashtekar was he speaking. Oh. And you know, Abai Ashtekar now believes, not many people believe him, but those who do loop quantum gravity. So they have this bound. They don't go really through singularity because of quantum effects. Oh, okay. But, 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 but it's that, not. That's all very extreme conditions. I mean, exactly. It's, that's very extreme. They wouldn't but, disagree but they would with be... anything about uh, primordial helium and the first second. Well, so this all is I'm saying later. is that um, when we get back to the very, very early stage, uh, then things are indeed uncertain. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, inflation 
has some evidence but is not compelling. And of course, the idea of three dimensions and one of time has to be jettisoned because there are extra dimensions. Time may not be a single parameter, etc. So there are all these different ideas that come in uh, at the quantum era. So, but I think it's very important to distinguish between the um, part of the Big Bang which is well established and the very early stages uh, when the physics is uncertain. And then Astrika has one idea and there are many, many others and some people want to bring in extra dimensions. Yeah, he even and wanted to claim that you can go, you know, not to see, I mean, if Lado meant really singularity itself, so then yeah. uh, he would claim there is no singularity and that you can go to inflationary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jan Soboda. Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> I was amazed that you made some sort of comparison between the evolution theory and evolution of uh, uh, cosmic space. Uh, now, making such a comparison, uh, we should take into account that in the case of biological evolution, you, uh, you have, uh, you, uh, there are involved many special uh, con sequences and consequences in a way that there, uh, we, we don't doubt about evolution, but what is the driving force of evolution? Uh, there, there can be involved uh, many specific changes on the level of uh, gene splicing, gene mutation, gene recombination. Now, when you look uh, at this problem from the point of physics, as I understood, you have two main forces, yeah. temperature and uh, uh, attraction. Uh, do you think that in order to explain the cosmic evolution you require to understand additional forces or is it enough to have these two main aspects or maybe I forgot some additional ones? I think you may have slightly misunderstood because I wasn't saying the similarity. Uh, I was saying that simple forces of uh, gravity and gas dynamics acting on fluctuations in the expanding universe can give rise to stars and galaxies. But then, of course, once you've got stars, you then get the periodic table, then you get planets, and then, of course, on planets like ours, you get the immense complexity of biological evolution. So uh, I, could, I was trying to emphasize that the uh, emergence of galaxies and stars is a very, very simple process with far fewer contingencies than what happened for uh, biological evolution. And indeed, I think it's a mistake that uh, astronomers talk about evolution of stars and galaxies, because that does give the wrong idea. It would be far better if they talked about development of stars and galaxies, because the, um, what happens in a star um, uh, over its lifetime, it's more like the development of a single organism rather than having any connotations of Darwinian selection. So um, I was talking about the development of stars and galaxies starting off from a hot, dense universe. And I think that can be explained just from uh, gravity and standard physics. Um, but once you get the complexity of biochemistry, then, of course, it's far, far more, more complicated. You see, the trouble is that even mathematicians speak about evolutionary equations. So evolution is everywhere. Yeah, I think it's, it's unfortunate. It is important yes. from mathematics. Well, I think that we should go on, because uh, we have still two lectures, and we have uh, Thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming. Um, well, uh, and technology, uh, which is UK's top level science and technology advisor board. He chaired a number of committees relating to policies for science, research, and the economy. He chaired the Society's Energy Work Group and Scottish Knowledge Transfer, or Royal uh, Society's Energy Group. I know also about Professor Bolton 
that he was vice rector of, uh, of uh, Edinburgh University. Uh, he was general secretary of, uh, of uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He has his group uh, dealing with climate change, etc. Yeah, and he has many honorary fellow doctorates from various universities. And he has a very beautiful um, uh, interest in science, which I think not many Czechs have, and that is glaciology. So he is interested in uh, glaciers and, and sediments and how they influence things. So, uh, you know, he had a very beautiful, ironical remark to uh, our student uh, who is there. No, Eliška Kozlova is still there when she, she was bringing him from the airport uh, to uh, here to the rectorate and he asked her what she is doing and she said, well, I'm doing general relativity, and Professor Bolton doing glaciology said, I saw this is a closed subject. <laughs> okay, Professor Bolton. Oh, I didn't say what you will speak about, but it will be there. It is errors at the water planet, I assume. Check's not so good. Can anyone suggest what I should press? Blood sending, is that like you're saying? Just read it this as C and above. Oh, of course, yes. Yes. yes of course. That, this one. Okay. Now, Martin has been talking about the wider reaches of the universe. Uh, I'm going to bring you home to this rather small and insignificant planet. But as far as we know, this small and insignificant planet is unique, at least at the moment, in one respect, and that is that it's a water planet. 72% of the surface of the planet is water. Water is here. <laughs> Not very much. And this, uh, this water contains 1,400 million cubic kilometers of water, which is rather more than this one does. Um, it contains about 82%, sorry, 92% of the total water of the planet. The other water is contained in groundwater and in, in great ice sheets. What's interesting is that although the water on this planet determines many, if not most, of the characteristics of our surface environment, we know very little about it. So the generality of us know very little about it. Whereas we look at the surface of the continents and we have a great diversity of views about them, views scientific, views pol political, views social, view, views po poetical, about the oceans, the oceans we regard merely as a resource. And it's about time we revise our view. Now, why come to the middle of Europe? a long way from the oceans and talk to you about the oceans. And the reason very simply is that most of the environment that aff afflicts your daily life here in the Czech Republic and in Prague is determined by how the ocean works. In principle, too, there may be another reason. This is J.B. Priestley, who was a very distinguished English author operating in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And uh, Priestley wrote uh, an essay, which I remember reading at school, about a rugby match. And in the rugby match, he was uh, exploring the possibilities for strange combinations of phenomena. And the strange combination he, he picked from the hat was maritime bohemia. <laughs> so one of the roles for this society could well be to discover where your shoreline lies. A modern understanding of the oceans, although we've had a superficial understanding for many, many centuries, indeed thousands of years, don't forget that it was 50, about 50,000 years ago that people uh, crossed from what is now Indonesia to Australia, so knowledge of the oceans was, has been present during a, a long period of uh, human history. Really, it was only in the middle of the 19th century with the Challenger expedition that really serious, focused scientific research in the oceans began. The rationale for it was very simple. It was commercial. The, uh, that, this is the period of the great maritime em empires, the fading Dutch maritime empire, the growing British maritime empire, 
trade was crucial, and trade depended on the oceans, the locations of, of harbors, the uh, way in which ocean currents served you or didn't serve, the way in which ocean winds blew. Uh, and this man, Charles Wyville Thompson, persuaded the British Admiralty to lease him this vessel, the Challenger, which was one of the newest steam frigates in the then British Navy. Uh, and he equipped the Challenger with state-of-the-art laboratories that you see there uh, and uh, conducted a remarkable expedition which lasted four years uh, from uh, uh, 1872 until 1876. Uh, that's the track of the expedition over that period of time, 70,000 nautical miles. It was an international expedition. Wyville Thompson was a very expansive man, uh, a very, very much an internationalist. He involved more than 100 uh, international scientists. The reports, which took 20 years to uh, produce, um, had comprised 50 volumes, and the results were profound and extraordinary. Uh, we began to learn, for the first time, the shape of the deep ocean basins of the Earth. Hitherto, we had not known how deep the oceans were, and we knew now, for the first, first time, how deep they were. The systematic plots of ocean temperature, the ocean currents, uh, many, many new species, uh, a record of, of, of seabed deposits, uh, and uh, his assistant, uh, Murray, coined the term for the first time, oceanography. And interestingly, it led to the first truly international body of any sort, which is the Scientific Committee for Ocean Research, which still exists and which was created in 1903. But modern ocean research is a, a much more intensive, more extravagant, uh, a, 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 and a, a, a much more powerful enterprise. This is an example of one recent but not uh, up-to-date uh, ocean vessel, the Glomar, Glomar Explorer, which has uh, traveled the world's oceans over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, drilling deep into the, in, into the ocean crust. And what I want to talk to you about is what we now understand about how the oceans work from three perspectives. The pre perspective of their geology, the perspective of their physics and chemistry combined, and the perspective of their biology, and then finally, what it might mean for us and why we should care about it. And the first great result of the modern era, the very modern era of ocean research, was produced about 30, 35 years ago, which is this topographic map of the oceans, uh, which is a remarkable map. One of the most extraordinary features of this map uh, are the mid-ocean ridges, which you can see I, can't, I don't have a point here as far as I can tell, but you can see these mid-ocean ridges which define the boundaries of the great tectonic plates of the Earth. Uh, those ridges play a fundamental role in the evolution of the Earth's surface and the inner Earth. They're the, they're the locations up which fresh uh, volcanic materials are exuded onto the surface, and as a consequence of that, of their production at the surface at the locations of those ridges, the, the the, the sea force spreads, spreads outwards from them at rates which we can calculate because we can do work on the paleomagnetism of the sediments which lie on the ocean floor and we can take any one piece of the ocean and tell how long it is since that piece of ocean arose from one of these mid-ocean ridges. So we can put timelines on the ocean. Thanks so much. Thank you. So mid-ocean ridges here and this dramatic one down the middle of the Atlantic, which uh, uh, connects with one in the Indian Ocean, which stretches around Australia into the Southern, into the southern Ocean. Uh, in detail, that topography is really quite extraordinary. This is a part of the North Atlantic. Here you see Greenland, uh, Norway, Britain. This is the continental mud, the continental shelf of Europe and Eurasia, uh, going up into the Arctic Ocean Basin, the continental shelf on the other side of the ocean, and here is the deep ocean, the deep North Atlantic, with an average depth of about three kilometers. And here, the deep Arctic Ocean Basin with a similar, a, a, a similar depth. Um, this is a detail of this part of the margin here. And what it shows is that the connection between the deep North Atlantic and the deep Arctic Ocean uh, is a series of deep troughs. A trough here, a trough here, and a trough here on the Greenland side. Those troughs are crucially important. This is one of them, the trough that lies here. There's this one, the Rockall Trough. 
Uh, and they're very important because the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean is controlled to some degree by the existence of those troughs. One of the other things that research from uh, vessels such as Glamour Challenger has created is a record of, of change through time. Uh, this is a diagram derived from sediment cores, uh, in this case a, a sediment core of about 140 meters in length, penetrates through sediments which have taken about three and a half million years to accumulate. Uh, and if we select from the sediment cores um, uh, calcareous microorganisms called foraminifers, we can determine from the isotopic composition of the shells of those organisms the approximately at least the salinity of the oceans at the time that they lived. And this diagram is a record of ocean salinity through time over the last three and a half million years. Uh, now, uh, these periods in blue are, are periods of uh, relatively low salinity, and these periods in red are, are periods of, sorry, the other way around, periods in red are the periods of low salinity, the periods in blue are, are, are periods of high salinity. Now, how do you change the salinity of the ocean? Uh, well, in the same way that you might change the salinity of a bucket full of saline water. If you want to increase the salinity, you evaporate water from the surface. If you want to decrease the salinity, you add water to the bucket. The oceans, in a sense, demonstrate exactly that. If you ask the question, how much water would we need to evaporate from the ocean surface to take us from this point of, uh, of high salinity to this point of low salinity, the answer is about 50 million cubic kilometers. It's a lot of water. Well, where did it come from? It just happens that that is the sort of volume that has been calculated from glaciology, by glaciologists of the great ice sheets that covered Eurasia and North America as late as 15 to 20,000 years ago. In other words, what we're looking at here is not merely a, a record of ocean salinity, but the first determinant of ocean salinity is ice sheet volume on Earth, and what we're looking at is a history of ice sheet volume change through time. Uh, and what we see is that three and a half million years ago, the Earth was a relatively warmer place with relatively small amounts of ice, and since then, progressively, the average ice volume on Earth has increased and the oscillations have become bigger and the period of those oscillations has increased. So prior to about three quarters of a million years ago, the dominant period of oscillation was about 40,000 years. Since then, we've had 100,000 year cycles going from one extreme of, of, of climate dominated by large ice sheets to an extreme of climate similar to that of the present day. Now, one of the things that we have uh, known for many years is that uh, parallel to these mid-ocean ridges, and this is the mid-ocean ridge in the, uh, in the southern Atlantic, parallel to that mid-ocean ridges, there are a series of subsidiary ridges which one finds on both flanks. Uh, and if you look at the spacing of the ridges on this side, they're pretty much the same as the spacing of the ridges on this side. They're mirror images of each other. The reason, of course, is that mass has been extruded from this volcanic ridge, um, both this way and this way, and the rates at which material is exuded onto the surface is determined the rates at which those plates have come apart uh, and new seafloor material has been, has been uh, 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 has accumulated. If we look at the, as I said before, we can date the age of these materials on the seafloor uh, from paleomagnetism. And if we look at that and we do a spectral analysis of the spacings, uh, some researchers published is that if you take the, the spectral analysis of the age differences between the ridges, there are three prominent spectral peaks, one at 20,000, one at 40,000, and one at 100,000 years. Now, those just happen to be the spectral peaks of Earth's climate change, which we believe is driven by changes of the Earth's orbit around the sun, and of course, they're also the in intrinsic periodicities of, of that orbit. So something strange is happening. The topography of the seafloor is being dictated by climate change. How can that happen? Well, the explanation that we have a month ago is that um, these massive changes in ice volume on Earth, of course, relate to changes in sea level. 
If you change the Earth's ice volume by 50 million cubic kilometers, then you either increase or decrease global sea level by 120 meters. If you decrease global sea level by 120 meters, you decrease the pressure on the crust in the oceans. Uh, that changes the depth to which melting will occur beneath these mid-ocean ridges and therefore influence the rate at which volcanic materials are extruded. If you take the pressure down, you get more melting, and you get more material coming out of the mid-ocean ridge, and you create larger, larger ridges. So it's extraordinary. Sometimes science produces results which are quite unexpected. No one expected to see anything like this, whereby climate change is fundamentally influencing on a relatively short time frame the way in which the topography of the Earth is created. Now, uh, that was a little bit about the geology. What about the water in the oceans? It's important to recognize what, it, what is the driving influence behind the what, in a sense, one could think of as the Earth's heat engine. And it's largely this. Uh, this is latitude from the equator to the South Pole to the North Pole. These are the, this is the, the, an indication of the received radiation, at, solar radiation at the surface. Uh, in the equatorial zone, the Earth receives uh, a, a larger uh, quantity of heat energy through a year then it's able to reflect or refract back into space. Uh, the polar regions, it's the opposite. Uh, they are able to, they uh, send back into space more heat energy than they receive from the sun. Uh, in principle then, if there were no other process, the equatorial region should get hotter and hotter and the polar region should get, warm, should get colder and colder. But of course there is another process and that is the means whereby heat is advected to higher latitudes in both, both hemispheres from the equatorial zone. And what is it that advects that heat? Well, it's the Earth's fluid envelope, consisting of these two components. On the one hand, the oceans. On the other hand, the atmosphere. And storms in the oceans and storms in the atmosphere are the means whereby that heat is advected in polarward directions. Uh, this is a calculation made some years ago of the relative contribution to the heat, the polewood heat advection in the oceans and the atmosphere. In this particular simulation, here's the equatorial, equatorial zone. The climatic equator is actually south of the geographical equator because of the uh, shape of the continents. But uh, in this particular simulation, uh, then the or, or analysis of the data, sorry, the atmosphere advects much more heat energy uh, in the polewood direction as the ocean. But there's a recent study, because it's a very difficult thing to do, which actually suggests the very reverse is true. Uh, and they believe that, uh, 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 US group believe that actually that's the ocean line, that's the atmospheric line. It's important that we understand these things because they're fundamental to the operation of climate. So if we think about the way in which the atmosphere works, what drives the circulation of the atmosphere? Part of it is this, the, the temperature gradient between the equator and the poles, of course, the other part is this, the rotation of the Earth. Uh, here, we're doing about 1,100 uh, kilometers per hour. It doesn't really feel like it, but uh, let's hope it doesn't stop. Uh, that rotation, uh, plus the temperature gradient, the polar temperature gradient, plus the fact that the continents form margins of these great ocean basins and therefore constrain the way in which heat can be advected, are the three principal components by which Heat is, is advected in the oceans, but also in the atmosphere. So if we look at patterns of, of reconstructed atmospheric winds, this one, I think, is from September uh, uh, 2013, I think. These are September, mean September uh, vectors for winds. And here you see this tremendous flux uh, in the Atlantic from the tropical and subtropical zone, giving storms driving north in, into, the, into the polar region, whereas in the southern polar, southern polar region, the polewood advection is less strong. The winds tend to blow around in a meridional fashion. Uh, one should regard those things as, as rather important because, of course, it's the storms that bring warmth. If we didn't have storms in, in the Atlantic, Britain and probably the Czech Republic would be much colder places. So storms are very welcome things. And this is one of them from two, winter, two winters ago. Um, over here, I think, is Britain is over here. Prague is somewhere in here. 
and this is one of the dramatic winter storms that blew in from the uh, blew in, uh, in, in a sequence from the Atlantic and caused major major flooding in many parts of West, Western Europe. Uh, <clears throat> If we then look at the ocean and look at the advection of heat in the ocean, this is a, a simulation based on, on real uh, ocean data um, of the, uh, uh, what it, the Gulf Stream, the flux of hot water, warm water that flows from the region of the Gulf of Mexico in a northeasterly direction and washes the shores of, shores of northeastern, northeastern Europe. That's surface water, and that's ad heat advection in surface water in the Atlantic. Uh, if we look at the pattern of flow of that surface water uh, coming up here along the coast of North America, flowing across the Atlantic towards Western Britain, penetrating um, into the, um, in, into the uh, Norwegian Sea and the Arctic Ocean via these channel, this, this particular large channel here, another one here, another one here. Um, a major flow of warm surface water. However, if there's a northward flow of warm surface water, there must be a southward flow to contemplate, to compensate. Uh, the question is, what is that southward flow, and how does that affect the structure and operation of the oceans? Well, one of the ways that we have used in very recent years to understand that is based on these remarkable, uh, remarkable gadget, gadgets, a so-called glider, I'm rather proud of it because it was, this glider was devised and, and built and now sold, I'm glad to say, by the Scottish Association for Marine Science, of which I'm president. These gliders are remarkable. They, they're based on modern battery technology, which gives them a life of about a year. They move through the oceans at walking pace, uh, but they have a pressure control mechanism which permits them to control their buoyancy. And what we do is we put them into the ocean, as you see here, they then descend to the ocean floor to some predetermined pre depth. When the pressure uh, trigger is activated, then uh, the buoyancy decreases, they rise to the surface. As they move through the oceans, they measure things like temperature, salinity, and other chemical, chemical and biological properties. When they rise to the surface, they send their data telemetrically back to the home station. Um, <clears throat> Some of the results they have produced have been quite remarkable. This is a section from Western Scotland here. This is to something like 200 kilometers east of Iceland. We're going down to a depth of 1,000 uh, meters. And what you see is the walk of one of these walking pace ocean gliders, here measuring salinity, here measuring temperatures. They go down and up and down and up and down and up. And basically, you get a record of both the salinity and the temperature for both. Most recently, an experiment has begun in which every week a new glider is put into the ocean. So a whole train of them are following each other across the North Atlantic to Iceland, where they're pick, picked out. Of course, the reason for doing that is to understand the way in which the ocean varies through, this, through, the, through the seasons. And what you see here is warm surface water, uh, which is uh, relatively highly saline, uh, warm surface water here, uh, and temperatures diminishing with, de with depth but not at the rate at which you would normally expect. Uh, we, can't, we have gone uh, deeper than this, and I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you what that looks like now. This is a section that's been made up from a whole series of experiments of the sort I've just shown. Uh, it's in the Atlantic, going uh, from the uh, polar circle, just off Greenland, uh, down, the, down to the South Atlantic, near to the southern tip of, of South America. And what it shows uh, is near the surface, you see warm uh, water uh, warmed up in the tropics and subtropics, flowing both north and south. Because it's very warm water, evaporation is quite strong from the surface. The consequence is the water becomes quite saline. It's relatively highly saline. As that water then moves to the north and it cools, then the combination of high salinity and lowered temperature increases the density of the water such that it sinks. Uh, the water sinks. It's here we're showing it sinking just off Iceland, or one of the ridges that connects Scotland to Iceland, uh, to produce deep water, uh, which is relatively, uh, relatively warm but highly saline water. Now, where does this deep water go to? Uh, well, it seems to stop here. But of course, the reason it seems to stop is because this is a two-dimensional diagram, and there's a third dimension coming out towards you. 
And exploring that third dimension has given rise to really quite a remarkable discovery, which was first hinted at some 15, year, 15 to 20 years ago, which is that the large-scale circulation of waters in the ocean is like this. Here you see the northward transport of uh, warm water, which I have tried just to describe to you. Uh, here the warm water sinks as, it, as the saline warm water gets colder. It sinks, becomes deep water. The deep water then goes into the southern Atlantic. Uh, it forms bottom water in the Antarctic regions. Some of it then circulates up into the Indian Ocean. Some goes into the Pacific and off uh, the southern India and off Alaska that uh, water rises to the surface. It uprises and forms another shallow water circulation current. Uh, and that is quite fundamental to the operation of the, whole, of the whole of the oceans. These areas of upwelling are crucial, of course, because they bring mineral nutrients from deep within the ocean towards the surface, and those mineral nutrients help to sustain marine life on a grand scale. So let's shift from the bit of the physics and chemistry of the oceans to the biology of the oceans. Uh, and of course, um, the biology of the oceans is rather wonderful. There are these great beasts, this tiger, tiger shark up, up, up in the north, um, some uh, dolphins chasing in front of the bow of a, a vessel, uh, this uh, magnificent basking shark up to about eight meters in length with an enormous maw uh, which it, in which it catches uh, uh, plankton. Uh, these have become very, uh, very profuse off the west coast of Scotland. And beautiful though they are, and although we warm to them and we care deeply about their futures and the whales, their cousins, it, the reality is that as, that as far as the planet is concerned, they're a bit like us, really unnecessary, which just aren't needed. Uh, but really, it's not the big creatures that matter in the oceans, it's the small ones. It's often the things that the eye can't see. And this is a, a shocking series of statements from those of you that attempted to uh, drink seawater, but actually drinking tap water produces a rather similar sort of response too. Each mouthful contains on map, approximately 300 million viruses, 30 million bacteria and archaea, uh, and over 30,000 microalgae and protozoans. Uh, why don't we die immediately when we gulp seawater? Well, of course, the reason is that they've been with us on this planet for a long time. We've adapted to each other, and actually it's, it's some of the rather more difficult beasts or beasts that occur in rather different circumstances that, uh, that give us problems. And some of them are remarkably beautiful. This is, uh, the, these are diatoms from the deep ocean, and this one in particular is, uh, I've called it an art deco diagram. Uh, I thought it would be particularly appropriate to show you in Prague, because one of its cousins is here in your town, in, in, your, in your town hall. <coughs> Um, you didn't realize that you had probably the world's largest diatom, did you? Oh. Yeah, hanging in proud down all. And, uh, and many, many species of phytoplankton, the phytoplankton being essentially the plants of the ocean. Uh, these are dinoflagellates. They, are, um, they produce red tides. When you're told you may not eat mussels, uh, very often it's because there's been a major diatom bloom and some of them can be highly, can be highly, highly toxic. Now, we tend to think of the uh, Earth's vegetation in, in these terms, a, a great forest, lichens, mosses everywhere, ferns, profuse vegetation. But in fact, there's more vegetation in the oceans than there is on land, 10 times more vegetation by mass in the ocean. The phytoplankton that I've shown you, though small individually, in the total mass is very, very large, very large indeed. Uh, and, of course, those phytoplankton form the food for zooplankton, small animals in the ocean. And those small animals in the ocean form the food for larger animals in the ocean. And the consequence, of course, is that we have a food web, uh, the base of which are the phy min minute phytoplankton present in the oceans in, 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 in massive volumes, which sustain not only the, the zooplankton, but also larger species, uh, I think from where I stand, it looks like, uh, looks like a penguin, uh, seabirds, sea animals, large mammals, and the like. Uh, which is why I say that actually the top of the food web is relatively unimportant in global terms in, 
in comparison with the, the lower part. In recent years, our capacity to sense what is happening in the oceans from space has been enormously important. Because as you can imagine, trying to sample the oceans from point locations and then putting all that data together, which of course changes through time, and trying to get a snapshot of what happens in the ocean biologically is very difficult. But this, for example, is something that we can do in relation to phyto, phytoplankton concentrations in the oceans by looking at but things like chlorophyll, chlorophyll concentrations. What you see very clearly is the, the major concentrations of phytoplankton, the major areas of essentially ocean productivity are along the margins of the continents, on the continental shelves, in particular places where deep water wells up towards the surface because it's being displaced by sinking, denser, cooler, more saline waters. And of course, at high latitudes, particularly in the northern hemisphere, uh, where there are uh, shallow continental shelves, but to some extent around, around Antarctica. And of course, these are locations which sustain fisheries on a, a, a grand scale. So how does all this biology work in the oceans, and why does it matter? Uh, well, it, it works in the way that, that the biology of the land works. The base of the food web is, is generated through photosynthesis, of the plants you see around you, the great sycamore tree that sits outside this building, then 98% of the mass of that tree is derived from what? From the air. The other 2% comes not from the soil, it actually comes from the water that's percolating through the soil, which carries some of the mineral nutrients it requires. So we have this magic process of photosynthesis, which from a gaseous air, or from essentially dissolved air in the oceans, is able to sustain this incredible growth, annual growth, of vegetable matter. So the phytoplankton generates something like 31 gigatons per year. Uh, they're crucially important in determining the way in which the ocean both breathes in and exhales carbon dioxide, and therefore crucial to determine the co carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. They release oxygen into the atmosphere, and also this chemical dimethyl sulfide which I'll come back to shortly, which is proving to be a rather crucial uh, genera generating product of the oceans. In the deep oceans, uh, they're, they're the principal source of mineral nutrients for, 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 uh, 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 from sediments in the ocean floor, and the zones of coastal upwelling are crucially important in essentially providing the mineral nutrients which phytoplankton need. So what's the role of the ocean in maintaining the habitable planet? Uh, well, I thought I'd tread on some of Martin's terrain. This one is too hot. That's Venus. It's got a terrible, terrible greenhouse effect. We wouldn't want to live in the greenhouse of, greenhouse of, of Venus. Uh, this one is Mars. It's a bit on the chilly side. Um, uh, but its atmosphere is only about 1% of the Earth's atmosphere in, in, in density. Uh, and of course, as we're all playing on this game of showing these gorgeous photographs of our wonderful planet. This one is just right. And the crucial issue for us now is to understand why it's just right. What is it that determines the state of dynamic equilibrium of the Earth's surface temperature and its climate? I think there are some very simple answers to that, but some complicated ones, and to some degree, we need the answers to the complicated questions. And this is where our, our, our friend dimethyl sulfide comes in. Those people who model the atmosphere and attempt to predict the future of climate, one of the problems that we've had uh, from the beginning of climate modeling is we don't understand clouds. The presumption has always been, the meteorology that you might have been taught, and I, I was certainly taught at school, uh, said that clouds formed uh, when the temperature falls below the dew point. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, clouds form well above the dew point. And we have long, I think, known or suspected or supposed that there must be nuclei around which clouds form at temperatures which are unrelated to the dew point. And it now looks as if we found the culprit. In climate models of the future, uh, it's been impossible to produce a rational means of, of generating cloud surface cover, and of course cloud is fundamentally important to the Earth's heat balance, uh, and so we parameterize them in the usual sorts of ways, which I'm sure many of you will understand, but now we think we know. We think it's these dimethyl sulfides which are generated by phytoplankton. 
uh, and the control on their generation is, is ocean temperature. So let's move on, and that's a natural point to move on, to our role in all this. Uh, because, of course, we have become rather important in the dynamics of the Earth. And, and it's not because the Earth hasn't known um, periods of time which are as dramatic in terms of the changing concentration of the atmosphere and the oceans, but it's that we're doing it so much quicker. Um, on geological timescales, the speed of human impact is dramatic in the extreme. Th on geological timescales, dramatic impacts, which have developed quite slowly, uh, have been absorbed into the system, buffered from the extreme change. And one of our problems, I think, is that we are looking at the potential for disequilibria on, on a, a, a large scale. Uh, and two of, the, two of the consequences of that you will know very well. Uh, one of them, this is the last 50 years uh, of measurement of atmospheric carbon dioxide measured in, uh, on Hawaii. Um, and everyone has presumed for many years, most of us have presumed that the principal impact of that will be on the atmospheric temperature of the Earth and the warming of the Earth and the change in the climate circulation. But over the last 20 years and more, 25 years, systematic measurements have been made which attempt to assess the global change in the acidity of the oceans. Because, of course, if we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the ocean, in the atmosphere, the oceans will absorb some of that, so they have more than usual carbon dioxide in the, in, in the surface layers of the ocean, which is weak acid, which acidifies the ocean. And this is the trend of acidification that we see with this annual, this interesting annual cycle in it. It's important to say that the present level of acidification in the oceans appears to be much greater than we have known for the last 65 million years. And if you want a good scare story, then the, the biggest mass extinction on Earth that we know of, of took place in the Permian, Permian some 250 million years ago of, in, in, in marine life. A dramatic reduction in marine biota, which had knock-on effects for continental biota. Uh, we now think we know why that happened. We think it happened because the oceans became more acidic, very much more acidic. Why did they become more acidic? Because the Indian tectonic plate was prone, w w uh, developed massive volcanism on a scale that had not been known in the more recent part of the geological past and hasn't been known since then. And we think the carbon dioxide thrown into the atmosphere by volcanism on the Indian plate increased the, acidity of the ocean, acidification of the oceans, and that generated an extinction in, 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 in ocean faunas. So it's an important issue, and we need to understand it. It would be very easy to come away from this and say, oh, terrible crisis on the way. You know, what's going to, what's going to happen here? This is a complicated phenomenon, uh, and a great number of people now worldwide are trying to understand, because there, are, there will be some countervailing feedbacks that have already been identified and simply extrapolating this into the future is hardly a sensible exercise, but we do need understanding. <coughs> and of course, that's the record of global atmospheric temperature, which many argue is a direct or an indirect consequence of the increase of greenhouse gases as a consequence of human activity. Uh, and the presumption is somehow that uh, global warming means warming of the atmosphere. Well, actually, it doesn't. If you ask the question, of the warming of the Earth's surface, or the Earth's fluid envelope, how much of the warming takes place in the oceans, and how much well, takes place in the atmosphere. And this is a recent estimate that actually most of it take, is taking place in the oceans. That the warming we see in the atmosphere is a relatively small part of the total global warming. So to think of global warming and climate, uh, atmospheric climate change in the same, in, in the same breath is, is not appropriate. This is, in a sense, much more difficult and potentially dangerous. And the reason why the oceans are, 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 such, is, are, are such, a, such dangerous beasts is they change very slowly. Uh, they warm up very slowly. They cool down very slowly. The atmosphere, in, in oceanic terms, warms instantaneously and cools instantaneously. So we are laying in place, by warming the oceans, changes that will persist for very long periods of time. And of course, one of the consequences of warming the oceans in the way that I've just tried to show 
it is thermal expansion of the oceans and much of the record of uh, relative sea level change, which we have over the last 150 years or thereabouts, we think is a consequence not of melting of ice, uh, which does of course contribute, but rather it's thermal expansions of the o expansion of the oceans. And just to, uh, just to uh, press home the case that we are making major changes in the way in which the oceans work, I mean, these are, this is, uh, doesn't look like it, but actually it is a photograph uh, from the subsea uh, beneath a great mass of coagulated plastic which is accumulated in the, in the central Pacific. And this shows, uh, this particular bottom right-hand one, shows uh, uh, the uh, uh, density or the weight per uh, square kilometer, uh, estimated weight per square kilometer of plastic uh, components greater than 200 millimeters in diameter. And you can see in these great sub-equatorial zones, the plastics in the ocean surface are, 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 are increasing dramatically. Um, we tend to think of plastics as, uh, uh, as non-reactive, all they are as objects floating in the oceans, but actually that's proving not to be true. And one of the other potential impacts is that the mid-ocean ridges, and this is a diagram showing one of them, the mid-ocean ridges are locations where minerals that are valuable to us have concentrations which are two to three orders of magnitude higher than the concentrations that, they're typically, that are typically found on the continental surfaces. As a consequence, though mining in the deep ocean is far more expensive than mining on land, the profit, potential profits to be made from the deep oceans are also much greater. And at the moment, there are a number of companies worldwide that are setting themselves up to, uh, to go in for deep sea mining, and the consequence, the potential consequences have really not been worked through one of them, of course, are plumes from the oceans, which are natural plumes, picking up mining detritus and spreading it through the oceans. And as we know from the products of drilling uh, in continental shelves for oil, uh, then the detritus that comes from such drilling operations can be extremely damaging to marine biota. And uh, one of the consequences of this, I think, or my explanation of why this is happening, uh, is that... Uh, uh, here you see uh, a territorial claim just made by Portugal and submitted to the Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, and it's based on uh, the fact that the Azores lie athwart the mid-ocean ridge uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, the lawyers have come up with a concept which they call the extended continental shelf, which has absolutely nothing to do with the real continental shelf. It simply gives coastal states the means whereby they can exploit as part of their exclusive economic zone much, much deeper waters. Uh, and arguably, uh, many of us feel that Portugal has made this claim primarily because of the potential for mining along the mid-ocean ridge. And of course, there are other areas where changes in the oceans are <coughs> eliciting a great deal of economic interest. The obvious one is the Arctic Ocean, where the extent of ice is much diminished. Uh, and we see the potential in future decades for trade uh, through the uh, Arctic Ocean. Because it's important to recognize that globalization, uh, the, the real agent of globalization is shipping. Pretty much all the stuff that we get from China comes by ships. ICT is useful, but ships carry it. Uh, and of course, the potential, uh, the economic potential of, of fast routes through the Arctic is enormous. Um, in other words, there are issues for the Arctic environment which are crucially important. So the oceans matter. They, uh, they're important for our climate, for our environment. They embody part of the Earth's natural capital. We have to recognize that the Earth has natural capital that yields to us an annual dividend. These remarkable, almost magical processes of photosynthesis generate for us freely this extraordinary harvest that's generated year upon year upon year. And that dividend is important for human economy in every sense, and human well-being in every sense. If we eat away at the capital, we also eat away at the dividend. Di biodiversity diminishes, and that has, a ser has serious implications. If the Earth's population is to increase to 9 million that Martin uh, suggested, uh, and numbers which have been given in excess of that, then that's the wrong time to diminish the capital, which, which creates an, an annual dividend. 
of the dividend at the moment, and I don't necessarily believe these numbers, that, that we may be missing an awful lot here, uh, is around about 24 trillion, it's been suggested, which is equivalent to something like the, worth's, the world's seventh largest economy, in a sense much more important than that. One of the arguments that I think we should be taking up very, very seriously, both at national and international levels now, in, in, in conserving the capital of the earth, which I would regard as the crucial uh, environmental concern, is that we should at least ensure that from now on, the capital stock does not diminish and hopefully increases. And if activities draw down that capital stock, then that the activities, the, the wealth generated by those activities ought to go into replenishing the capital stock in, in some form or another. Because unless we're able to do this, not only in the oceans, but more broadly in the Earth's environment, from, in simple economic terms, the future looks rather, do, does not look promising. And I simply leave you with this. The oceans are an economic resource and all those things, but also we ought to regard them in, in the ways that we regard the land, as an inspiration for poets and artists, for recreation and restoration of the human spirit. Those of us that just even paddle in the shallow waters enjoy them, and those of us that go a little further enjoy them even more. So please, what about taking the oceans seriously? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful lecture, full of art deco, except for this one slide with a lot of smoke. It was very <laughs> marvelous. Um, I, I, I will immediately ask for discussion, but what was with this J.B. Priestley at Maritime Bohemia? I didn't get the point. You, you started with J.B. Priestley, whom as a young boy I read. But then there was Maritime Bohemia. What was that? Well, no, no, I, I want to give you a lecture about older English literature of his mistake of maritime, but what was the point here? Well, no, the point was simply, I mean, it, was, it, it was an English joke. Um, but uh, J.B. Priestley speculated that there might be a place called Maritime Bohemia, and I was merely encouraging you to look for it. What, what it means, actually, Maritime Bohemia? Does it mean that it's surrounded by sea? Uh, maritime means, means uh, appertaining to the sea. Okay, because you know, I, I'm sure that half of audience here knows this. Shakespeare, in, uh, not, this is not your original, but Shakespeare in Winter Tales gives to Bohemia the sea. If, if you look, so, so the Shakespeare was convinced that Bohemia has the sea. It is in this Winter Tales. There is also Bohemian, uh, some wild uh, uh, night coming from these things, but uh, have a look in Winter Tales. This ocean, well, this is a difference between ocean and sea. Is there a difference between ocean and sea? I, I, but by sea, I mean ocean, yes. I mean some maritime Bohemia. This is what I mean. Okay, questions? Over there. Sorry? Okay, uh, yeah. I have my uh, one general comment, I mean, uh, about the climate. It's a question, we have one state, Earth, with atmosphere, and some radiation is coming from sun. And we are, of course, losing some energy. And, but then there's the final state, and something happened in between, the life origin, and uh, something was developing the system, and now uh, we, we need to discuss what is the balance between, between we lose and we get, because from this point of view, we couldn't be afraid of global warming, because then will come again global cooling. I used to give a, a little exercise to my uh, final year students to uh, design a planet. And uh, what I would do is give them a life form and say, this life form could exist in this temperature range. I want you to design a planet which would ensure that temperature range. And uh, I, what I would do is give them the distance of the planet from the, the, the or the distance of the planet from the sun, and they would, uh, they would then, uh, and the, uh, solar emission, and they'd have to calculate the planetary surface temperature, and uh, they always got it wrong. Uh, now, they were clever students, um, uh, uh, and what I, what I then did, of course, was to give them the atmospheric 
composition of our planet, and they were then able to utilize equations that were developed 100, 100 years ago to try to evaluate, in, partly empirically based, to evalu evaluate a greenhouse effect. And they recalculated and got it, got it right. In other words, if you want to design a planet with a particular temperature, what you do is change the composition of the atmospheric gases. If you want a warmer planet, you shove more in. If you want a colder planet, you, 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 you take, take it out. Uh, and uh, of course, it's the balance that matters. And the question is, what's the ambient temperature of the surface that will maintain the balance of incoming and outgoing radiation? And of course, you're right. And the large question for us is, what is it that controls the, the, the atmospheric composition? Um, and what are the processes by which we will lose radiant energy? Uh, and of course, I mean, if you look at my diagram, the, the diagram I showed you of climate change through time, one of the things that's quite used to puzzle us was that uh, the Milankovitch hypothesis, that's the hypothesis that uh, it's uh, Earth's, the Earth's orbit around the sun which determines the long-term pattern of climate change, um, that fits beautifully onto our long-term record of change. The only problem is, is that if we look at the uh, attempts to evaluate the change in global temperature from the coldest part of the last glacial period of the present day, it's about five degrees Celsius. If you calculate the impact of Milankovitch changes, it's about half a degree Celsius. In other words, it predicts the periodicity of change, it doesn't predict the amplitude. And 30 years ago, a Belgian, um, a, a Belgian geophysicist came up with the answer, and of course he remembered the greenhouse effect, and his argument was, it's probably carbon dioxide. Uh, the, what then happened was the Antarctic drilling program run by the Russians and the French then decided what they would then do is look at the carbon dioxide composition in, uh, in air bubbles in the ice with depth and what they demonstrated was that the periodicity of uh, temperature change deduced in Antarctica from the isotopic composition of the ice matched almost perfectly uh, the CO2 composition in the atmosphere as represented by bubble, bubbles in the ice. So it's complicated business, but actually you can reduce it to simplicity. And the crucial thing is to look for the, look for the elements which make it simple, rather than focusing all the complicated things that are rather difficult to, difficult to analyze. Concerning the high concentration of productive oceanic, uh, of high oceanic productivity in the northern Atlantic, uh, is it, is it, isn't partly uh, this the effect of upwelling on a larger scale than anywhere else in the ocean? Because the ocean is squeezed a bit between Greenland and northern Europe and the Spitsbergen. And then, of course, in the temperate seas, we may have uh, uh, twice a year uh, temperate uh, thermal uh, change of stratification, which means bringing up nutrient-richer water from deeper parts of the uh, biologically active part of the ocean, where biological productivity depends on photosynthesis, apart from the deep parts which, where the productivity depends on thermal springs from the bottom of the ocean. So I'm wondering whether it's not a combined effect of upwelling and str uh, changing stratification. Yes. Well, the, the, if you look at the extent of continental shelves globally, what you find is that the most extensive shelves are concentrated in the higher latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, in and around the North Atlantic, on the, the, um, <coughs> the Europe and Asian uh, borders of the Arctic Ocean, around Alaska and the Bering, the Bering Straits. And of course, upwelling at the continental margins, then the, those upwell waters then are flushed over the shelf, uh, which, which sustain uh, animal life, plant life and animal life in the zone in which light is able to penetrate, which of course is a highly productive zone. So really it's, it's not a, I mean, we have lots of mineral nutrients coming up from down below by upwelling. The question then arises, is how extensive is the zone where light penetrates, where photosynthesis can happen? And of course, 
large, the continental shelves are quite shallow, uh, the, the ocean is extremely deep, and so the contribution of continental shelves to the photosynthetic synthetic activity is just so much greater. Okay, I, I would like to have a very short, very brief question with brief answer, please. I had once to, to give a general talk, so, and I wanted to join it also with meteorology. So I went one floor above, and they said actually there are very few stations which matter, uh, measure weather on the sea, and that they are just increasing. It was the lecture I gave in 90s, how it is. It is increasing more and more uh, observations which are made on the uh, sea level, I mean ocean level. Well, I think, I think that the many observations which were made at sea uh, are now long, long, no longer necessary because we can make much better observations. When I say better, I mean, well, much better observations from space. And when I say mm. better, what I mean is that they are better able to sample the, the aerial distribution mm. of a mm -hmm. characteristic. Whereas if you have a point here and a point 500 miles away and a point another 500 miles away, then the contouring of ocean characteristics mm. is a very uncertain process. And in the oceans, 500 miles is quite a short distance, not a long distance. Mm. So many of the processes which we're concerned about require high density sampling, and we simply can't afford, frankly, mm -hmm. and can't organize sufficient high density sample to capture many of the issues that we see. Mm -hmm. So for example, I showed you the so-called um, uh, 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 North Atlantic drift the, um, the warm water flux from the, from the Caribbean and the, uh, and the equatorial zone. In fact, that's not a stream, it's not the Gulf Stream, it's not a stream of water at all. It's a series of eddies, which are about 100 kilometers in diameter. And those eddies are spun up like a spinning top by storms in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So storms in the atmosphere and storms in the ocean go on at the same place in the subtropics. But because the atmosphere is much less viscous, the atmospheric storms float away from the ocean storms. And so the, 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 the so-called uh, um, uh, North Atlantic drift, uh, the, the, the Gulf Stream, is actually a series of eddies. It's not a stream at all. Well, that's interesting, certainly, you know. OK, I think that we should uh, finish. Thank you very much indeed. It was marvelous that you came as well. So, our last very sportive speaker, uh, Professor Sir Brian Heap, uh, is from Cambridge, also from the University of Cambridge. He's a honorary professor in the University of Nottingham, uh, former master of St. Edmund's College, not Emmanuel, by them, and, and president of the European Academies of Science Advisory Council. So, Professor Paches and Palos and other people uh, know him from the, from the past interactions. He published extensively on endocrine physiology, reproductive biology, and biotechnology, was the director of research at the Institute of Animal Physiology and Genetics Research, and the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. He's elected fellow of the Royal Society. He, had, uh, he held posts as foreign secretary, vice president, and uh, editor of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society 3SB. This is older than proceedings of Royal Society, isn't it? These philosophical transactions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and Professor Heap speaks now about can genetically modified crops help to feed the world? Thank you very much. Uh, I will give you an abbreviated form because time is moving on. But I would like to share with you some reflections on uh, what has been happening in the field of uh, biotechnology with respect to uh, GM crops. And, yeah. So I'd like to look at three questions. What is the challenge? Well, the challenge, I think, will be clear to many, if not all of us, that one, of, one in six people will go hungry tonight. One in six. So the second question is, can the science of genetic modification help to address that type of problem? And what are the hopes and fears that come with it? And I made a declaration at the bottom. I do not hold any grants or consultancies from Monsanto or any other plant breeding organization. And I have no industrial funding so that we can get that out of the way to start with. 
So we face an increasing demand for the world's finite resources. And we, despite the evidence that the world has enough food for everybody, the big problem, of course, with that is distribution and also that it's not always the right type of food. So although we may be able to address distribution, it's going to be extremely expensive to do so and it's going to have a negative effect on climate change. In addition, the type of diet which people eat in developing countries is incompatible very often with the type of food that we would like to move around the world. In other words, many people, one in six in particular, lack the capability to obtain food or to pay for it. And it's what Amartya Sen has called the deprivation of capabilities. People are not capable to get food. So it's clear, however, that there are no quick fixes. And although I'm going to concentrate on GM, let me give you a health warning at the beginning that this is not a quick fix. And I shall repeat that at the end in case anybody thinks that I'm suggesting for a moment that GM crops are going to be the silver bullet. So you can see from this graph here, the global population, the developing country growth. Here's the developed country growth. And as a result, FAO estimate that we're going to have to increase food production by 70 to even 100%. One of the reasons is reflected in this graph here, which reminds us that average cereal yields are a valuable indicator of uh, food production. And in some areas of the world, cereal yields have increased, while in others, like the African continent of 62 countries and associated territories, you can see that there's been hardly any change in the tons of cereals produced in this particular case, uh, tons of cereals produced per hectare. And that's over the last 50 years or so. So the brilliant improvements of plant breeders, which in the UK have led to increases in wheat yield, climbing like this remarkably, here's the fertilizer application. That sort of impact has not occurred in Africa. Let's look at what it says here. The average yields have increased 2.8 to 8 tons per hectare of wheat. Incredible increase. And this is due to the brilliant work of plant breeders, not just in the UK, but worldwide, who've had a dramatic effect on plant breeding. The proportion of the increase due to plant breeding was estimated to be about 50%, 48 to 82 rising to more than 90% over the last 25 years. But, now this is the critical point. This is one of our plant breeders in Cambridge, Bingham, a distinguished plant breeder, who said the current rate of progress in varietal yield can be maintained for some years. However, there's no prospect of a stepwise increase in yield, as in the Green Revolution, unless the physiology of the crop can be radically altered. So he's drawing attention to the fact that wheat yields have plateaued, and that's fairly typical in many parts of the world. And there is a concern that climate change has also started to suppress food production uh, during the last three decades. And overall, the changes brought about around the world uh, through, uh, climate, uh, through warming climate have bumped up food commodity prices by about 6.4%. The impact of these concerns, I think, is reflected rather graphically in this slide, which shows that increase of food inse insecurity with demand exceeding supply, prices increasing sharply, and serious social unrest. And so FEO have a back basket of commodities that they put together, and from that, they estimate the food price index. And you can see what happened to the food price index during the 207, 208, 210, 211, coinciding exactly with social unrest. 
And so I want to put this discussion of GM crops and whether they're going to be able to help us to feed the world in the context of food security and food insecurity and social impact. During those peak times, food crises pushed around 100 million people into hunger, but the result was not only the result of food shortage, but also uh, market volatility and speculation. And these sent prices through the roof and sparked riots in several countries, North Africa in particular, as we're all familiar. And the countries that are most at risk are those where food makes up a large proportion of overall spending. 40% in China, 45% in Indonesia, 50% in India, 70% in Congo. These are the countries which are particularly susceptible. So the challenge which we're going to consider in this next uh, half hour is threefold. We have to find a way of increasing our agricultural pr productivity, especially of nutrient-rich foods. Secondly, we have to do it in ways that reduce inequality rather than increase inequality. And thirdly, we have to reverse and prevent further degradation of the land resource. So let's take a historical picture briefly and ask ourselves, well, how did agriculture historically rise to the challenge? And here's the classical experiment from Rothamsted Research Institute in the UK, which has been the longest continuing experiment since the early 1860s, going out along here, where you look at wheat yields grown on land year after year without any treatment. So here's the classic example, no fertilizers, no insecticides, no herbicides, uh, and that's the picture you'll get. So if you then introduce, in this age of mechanization, improved plant breeding so that you now have shorter stemmed wheat varieties, for example, or you increase fertilizer use, or you start herbicide usage, or you introduce the range of chemicals, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and eventually you come here to biotechnology, is this a new technology that is going to help in the situation that we have at the present time? So in the past, agriculture has addressed these problems by uh, using new technology. And in future, it's very clear that we will have to produce on less land the amount of food that we produced previously, as was reported in a Royal Society report uh, published a couple of years ago called Reaping the Benefits and in which the phrase sustainable intensification was coined to illustrate the point. That is, we have to intensify our production on the land we've got, because there isn't much more land available for arable purposes, but we have to do it sustainably. So sustainable intensification is the word that is now used, the phrase that is now used as the way forward. So let's just think for a moment about developing countries and what technologies have been used and are being used in the present. So there are traditional and intermediate technologies, as Gordon Conway illustrates in this slide, which I've modified slightly. Here's a home and a garden in Java. Huge amount of bio biodiversity in this garden. We have thousands of plant species. We only use 15 of them <laughs> to produce food. And here's a garden that is rich in biodiversity. Drip irrigation has had a dramatic effect in many parts. And in Kenya, a friend of mine who has developed kickstart uh, irrigation uh, using this technique here, he's developed an irrigation pump that now has lifted 660,000 people worldwide out of poverty, out of poverty. It's a very simple device, but it's also very effective. So appropriate technologies are important and we need to recognize that, particularly when it comes to water 
and water use. Another thing is integrated pest and disease control, which is essential. In Kenya, 70% of the corn for the maize that is grown is affected by this dreadful parasite weed, striga, witch weed. 100 million people are affected, $1 billion loss. And here's a simple method to coat the seed in emesopyr, which is non-GM, coat it in a chemical, so that as the seed uh, starts to develop, striga also develops at the same time, but emesopyr kills the striga. So here's a herbicide that kills a seed with, with, which it is co with which the chemical is coated. And this is an interesting example of how s hundreds and thousands of people are benefiting from quite a simple technology that has in, in, been introduced in this uh, classification of integrated pest and disease control. Now let's take the next step. How can biotechnology help? Let's look at this side of the slide first, because here is an estimate of the overall losses from pests, as, which can be as high as 50%. So we go up from the bottom, you can see 15% due to insects, 13% pathogens, 14% weeds, 10% losses after the crop has been harvested. This is why pest and disease control becomes so critical if we're going to improve the efficiency of food production. And one of the ways to do it is to build productivity and sustainability into the seed. The seed isn't uh, simply a dormant structure that you put into the ground. You try to build into it these items here. Increasing nutrient uptake, improving nutritive value, increased drought tolerance, increased water efficiency use, counter new disease and pest outbreaks. So here you can see at the bottom, plant infecting fungi, which has increased over the last 20 years or so. And here you can see the distribution of some of these pathogens, which are increasing in incidence ge geographically and also in host range. So biotechnology may be a way to start addressing and thinking about these problems in new ways. And that is one of the features that needs to be flagged at this stage. So the steps involved, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the, the technology, let me go through it very briefly. You identify the gene that you're interested in, you isolate it, you insert it in a genetic construct, you multiply it in vivo, uh, in vitro, and you then transfer the gene into small plantlets, which can be done by different methodologies, which I'm not going to digress into. And you then select the transformed cells, which should contain the gene which you've introduced. You then go through this very extensive process of evaluating which plants have got the seed. Um, so far as plant breeders are concerned, this is a wonderful opportunity to grow thousands and thousands, millions of plants to try to find the one or the group of plants that are expressing the gene. This is a hugely time-consuming but extremely important process. And then the crosses that are made to other varieties to make sure that those plants are stable, and that the gene will be transplanted, will be transferred from one generation to another successfully. Now science, of course, never stands still, as we've heard brilliantly earlier on this afternoon. And here's a whole list of new technologies that are on the way. This is the standard transgenic technology that was used at, right from the beginning. But now we have a number of other ways of taking sequences from the same or a compatible species. There are the plant scientists have ways to silence genes so that you don't introduce DNA anymore, which is what you do here. 
You change this by introducing a gene into the plant, but in this case, you silence the gene that you want to silence, uh, or you modify it in some way by this method, or you induce mutations by this. And these are just, this is just a small selection of new technologies that are on the way. This, incidentally, in passing, provides a headache for the regulators at the European Commission, but we can come back to that at the later stage. So the aim for biotechnology is to build productivity and sustainability into the seed and to counter pest and disease. Now, farmers have demonstrated in a pretty dramatic way that a lot of them are very keen on this technology. Here you can see the growth total. Here you can see the increase in industrial countries, and here you can see it in developing countries. And look at that, where the crossover has occurred. More farmers are growing GM crops these days in developing countries than they are in <coughs> developed countries. A record 18 million farmers in 28 countries planted at 181 million hectares. In 2014, a sustained increase of three to four <coughs> percent. And the slide uh, shows us that um, there is a significant number of farmers who are responding to the availability of this technology. In fact, it is claimed, and I think the data are pretty good, that this is the fastest uptake of an agricultural technology in the history of agriculture. And there are data to support that view. So the picture is, what about, why are they so interested in it? Well, you can introduce a gene that makes a plant resistant to a herbicide so that you can go into a field and spray it with this herbicide and it will destroy all the weeds. <coughs> but it will leave the plants that you're interested in, the, the wheat or the maize or whatever, <coughs> it will leave it untouched and it grows in a relatively weed-free environment. Or you could put virus resistance or insect resistance, uh, as has been done particularly with crops like cotton. <clears throat> so the crops most commonly grown at the moment uh, carry either herbicide tolerant, insect resistance, or what are called stacked traits, where you get multiple genes which are introduced, uh, and this is now the new application. So what is the impact of these crops? What are the hopes uh, for using it in this way? <clears throat> well, here we see a meta-analysis of 147 studies showing that for the main crops, soybean, maize, and cotton, the yield has increased 22%, chemical pesticide use down 37%, farmer profits up by 68%. That's a recent analysis uh, from a group working in Germany. Second analysis from some economists working in the UK, they rather confirmed the same sort of result with pesticide change going down, reduction of 18.3%. Carbon emissions are down equivalent to taking 10 million cars off the road, that is, you don't have to spray so frequently, and therefore it's not necessary to use your tractors, your agricultural equipment to the same degree, and global farm, incre uh, farm income is also showing a significant increase. So there are farmer benefits, but what about the consumers? Are the consumer benefits that we can consider? Here we see evidence that consumers do stand to benefit. And this has been, this has been a touchy area. And if only, if only the GM companies had started to address more seriously uh, consumer interests right at the beginning instead of their own potential in industrial interests, we might have been in a different position today. So there are yield increases, there are societal benefits, there are environmental benefits I've touched on, decreased sprays and so on. There are many other products on the way. The pipeline is remarkably full. 
healthier soil oils for healthier consumers. There are trial plant uh, plantings in the US uh, with uh, plants that will have a higher level of omega-3, for example. Late blight resistant potato, fewer sprays. At the moment in the UK we spray for potato blight about 18 times a year. The intention is to get it down to one or two sprays per year. Drought tolerant maize, more food. The US approval of a drought tolerant maize, and here's a farmer we met in the, <coughs> just outside Nairobi with, with his uh, GM maize crop. So there are consumer benefits, but those are the hopes. What are the fears? Well, there's the fear of the unknown, and inevitably the first question that always comes up is, is it safe? And there are questions of risk and risk assessment, notoriously hard to discuss rationally. There are risks and benefits to the environment and wildlife. They're no different from the introduction of any new plant variety or hybrid. And Nicolia reviewed 1,783 publications between 2002 and 10, concluded there were no significant hazards directly connected with the use of GA, GE crops as far as human health was concerned. There's been a whole raft of organizations who've carried out studies, World Health, FAO, and I've been involved in some of them, the Royal Society one, the European Commission and so on, European Commission recently spent 200 million euros on doing a health study. What's interesting, I think, about these studies is that um, <clears throat> there seems, although there's consensus in the, among the scientific community, uh, there's an interesting point raised in a paper that's just come out by uh, philosophers Sanderson, Sander van der Leyde de Linden and Stefan Lewandowski, who emphasized recently that consensus information has far-reaching consequences in neutralizing the effect of ideological worldviews. And they produce a lot of data to show that that is the case. Consensus building is a critical issue in science. However, this doesn't seem to apply for GM crops. The so-called merchants of doubt and their misinformation campaigns prevail despite analyses and huge amounts of money being spent on this sort of thing. And it supports the ideas of Dan Cairn from Yale that partisanship can even undermine our very basic reasoning skills. In other words, if a person's got a particular ideology or a particular religion, even the facts don't enable them to change their position at all easily. Let's just look at these fears a bit further because transparency, are we told all that is known as a result of these studies? Well, food and safety risk assessment has to be carried out. You have to check the differences between a GM cop and a comparity. You have to check an allergenicity you have to look for unintended effects on all those hundreds of thousands of plants that are transformed. You have to do an environmental risk assessment, see whether it interacts with target organisms, whether the long-term effects, and here are the number of files for one event, one transgenic event. Those are the typical number of files that have to be prepared for the European Food Standard Agency if you're going to try to get one of these things commercialized. So risk assessment is essential. You have to meet international requirements, the Cartagena protocol, OECD <coughs> protocols. You have to do extensive studies of harmonization, long preparation phase, and for compliance costs for insect resistant maize, you won't be able to see the figures here, but the bottom figure is seven to 15 million dollars. So there's the cost of trying to make things transparent, carrying out the proper risk assessment. It's expensive. <coughs> now, Europe has adopted a precautionary principle. 
This states that if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, the burden of proof that it is not harmful rests on those taking the action. And this, of course, has put Europe in a particular position with respect to the rest of the world. The Eurobarometer survey recently asked the question, do you agree or not with the use of biotechnology for food security? And 77% of EU citizens said they were in favor of taking advantage of biotechnology in agriculture. However, look at the distribution across Europe of those in favor, wavering or against, and here's their voting in Parliament. And it's quite extraordinary to summarize what's happened in the USA over the last 10 years, where 25 new transgenic plants were put to the FDA, all passed, and 24 of them are now commercialized. During the same period, 24 transgenic events were put to the European Food Standards Agency, zero commercialized. So Europe's positioned itself in a particular way. We import over 60 kilograms of GM soya bean products per citizen for animal feed. Slovenia and Cyprus are big importers, but they vote against the science. Netherlands, Spain, Portugal and Ireland are big importers. They vote with the science. Germany, Denmark, and Belgium are big importers, and they're variable on their voting. So there's no clear correlation between trade volume and voting behavior. Voting is politically motivated and does not correlate with farmers' needs. Sometimes we forget what a far-reaching effect Europe still has, and not least in Africa. So in Africa, there are four countries, Egypt, Sudan, South Africa, and Burkina Faso, which have passed the biosafety law, they've done the confined field trials, and they grow commercial crops. South Africa is a major one, but Burkina Faso is fascinating because some years ago, uh, the president decided that the country would switch from growing conventional cotton to growing GM cotton and nearly all the cotton grown in Burkina Faso is GM, and it's transformed the country, although sadly they've now run into a political problem. There are some countries that are on the cusp of passing the National Safety Bio, uh, Biosafety Bill. Don't forget, you cannot grow GM crops commercially unless you have a, nice, uh, a National Biosafety Bill. There is a legal, international legal requirement you can't just grow crops. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's going to be a challenge for many African countries. When you think of the price that it, uh, that it takes in order to uh, get a, a crop approved. So there are lots of negative representations of GMOs which tap into intuitive preferences. And this is especially influential in Africa. So we have evidence of essentialism. DNA is the essence of an organism. Transferring a gene from a fish into a tomato, breach of species boundaries. Teleological and intentional thinking, nature is a beneficial agent or process. Blame God. Disgust, genetic modification as contamination, GMOs cause diseases and sterility, contamination of fields and food and of feed. These are some of the negative representations uh, which are spoken about. And we found them particularly represented in Africa, which is where we've been working over the last uh, three or four years. Uh, we've recently completed a project in Ghana, Nigeria, <laughs> Tanz Tanzania and Uganda. And that was an interesting experience because what we found was the need to put together 
a series of short essays in books of this type, and I have a couple of them here. Uh, this is Insights and this is Viewpoints. These are 1,000, 1,500 word essays in accessible language for policymakers. Some of them are written by African scientists, actually. We also ran a series of media fellowships uh, run by my colleague Bernie Jones. And these were of interest particularly because it meant that the journalists were hearing for the first time what is a gene. We taught them basic genetics. We taught them basic plant genetics. We didn't push GM. We said, we will teach you more about the basic of this new technology. And then you have to decide for yourself. We took them on field trials, and uh, many of them had never been in a laboratory. And many of them failed to get their articles into the African newspapers or onto African radio uh, because it, agriculture was regarded as one of the lowest of the lowest in terms of occupation. That's the scene that we find, and it's not something that we've discovered, it's actually quite common in Africa. So the outcomes at the end of that is that we had 160 journalists through our program. We had master classes. We visited more than 45 African research scientists, more than 30 African research institutes, went on field trips, we published these essays, and they published over a thousand media pieces. And now the uh, newspaper and journal editors are asking them to write items for their newspapers. Now this isn't going to change the attitude in Africa overnight. The damage has been done, there's been misrepresentation as I've mentioned already, and the anti-GM movement and in particular uh, Greenpeace have made very negative statements about GM in Africa. Uh, so much so that they're actually funded by the European Commission. That's another story. So in summary, I think what we have been learning from this experience, and particularly in relation to Africa, we can put together in the following way. Is it safe? No effect on human health has been found. Uh, think of the millions of people and millions of meals in the USA since this technology was introduced. And there's not been a single court case on the grounds of human health. Risks and benefits to wildlife are no different from the introduction of any new plant. And then, of course, our African colleagues would say, is it natural? Is it natural? Is it plain God? Humankind's been growing, modifying plants by selection and seed collection for centuries. And what we grow today here, and the wheat here, the wheat compares nothing at all with the grass from which it was derived uh, when it was selected 10,000 years ago. Is it fair? Well, developers need a fair return uh, when you think of the investment that has to go into this sort of area. But developing countries need access to the technologies, and there is a developing public-private partnership sharing scheme which is coming on extremely well and in fact by now there is a good cohort of African biotechnology scientists who have been trained overseas and are now setting up their own laboratories and preparing their own uh, GM crops uh, for Africa itself. But public concerns are always expressed when they see science and its presentation is shaped solely by commercial interests. And this, this has been a very undermining influence, uh, particularly in African countries, and also in Europe, I, I hasten to add. <clears throat> There's another dimension that African countries are very worried about, and that is, will they be able to sell their GM products into the European market? And that's extremely, they think it's extremely important for them. In actual fact, more important that they trade with each other within the continent of Africa. And there is absolutely no reason on the basis of the present arrangement why they couldn't sell animal feed, GM animal feed into Europe as the USA does and, and other countries. But it's the fourth hurdle 
And this is the one, really, that came to the fore in Europe uh, when we go back over the history. Uh, is it needed? Maximizing food security requires that benefits outweigh the costs. Remember that this technology came into Europe when we had milk lakes and we had grain mountains. And at that point, who wanted more food in Europe? We had excess. But of course, the situation is now different. We are now facing a very different scenario with uh, with a population increase, as we've heard already, going up to 9 or 10 billion by 2050. And at the moment, we still can't feed all our population at the present time with 6.2 6 billion. How are we going to manage at 9 to 10 billion? So part of my argument is that here's a technology that we can hardly afford to ignore. It is something that, as I said at the beginning, is not a silver bullet, but it is an important technology. And so I may summarize with lessons that I think we've learned, I hope we've learned. First of all, there is a history to this, which we must be careful not to ignore. And uh, I'm happy to discuss it if need be, but it does go back to our German friends, the German Greens, and their activities in the 1980s. Secondly, I think we have to be aware of the importance of two-way communication. It's not just a case of scientists telling and speaking about these new developments, but it's also the media and people listening to the arguments. And I always feel that that is one component that was missing in the UK at any rate in the 1990s. There were a lot of scientists talking about it, but the media were very negative uh, for a whole range of reasons. Third thing I think we've learned is that Europe has still has a big influence on African countries. They're more interested in what's happening in Brussels than what's happening in Washington. The colonial past is still very strong with our African colleagues. Fourth thing we've learned, the power of misinformation and the way that that has been used and abused. And finally, I think, latterly, <clears throat> you go back to Martin's point where he said that he thinks the biological systems are much more complex than the wonderful things that he's been talking about. But I think the most complex and mystifying aspect is human behavior and why we respond to certain things in the ways that we do and why do we find ourselves in this complex situation in Europe. Thank you very much. Brian He for useful lesson and interesting lecture. Talks, uh, talks finished, but questions. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, come on. Thank you, Brian. So I'm curious to know with the information or the data you have on people's attitudes in Africa, to what extent you have data about how that varies across gender and um, educational um, background as factors. So does that make a difference? Yeah. I don't have data which I can quote to you offhand on that particular point. Uh, certainly the Eurobar Eurobarometer has analyzed that. Uh, my data uh, was um, a composite figure. Uh, so I would hesitate to get into that question. Um, what I think I can say, particularly from our Africa experience, is that there was a commonality. There was a commonality of negativity uh, between uh, men and women, and also with youth as well. That is, the, the negativity that had been spread through misinformation was pretty widespread. The exceptions to that, uh, by the time we'd finished our course, was that many of the journalists who came on our course, I guess, 
60% of them were men, 40% of them women. Of the 40% who were women, half of those would be Muslim, and they were some of the brightest uh, uh, journalists. And it was true that in the case of all the 160 journalists we had, about 50% of them were smallholder farmers themselves. So in Africa, the situation is that the majority of farmers in Africa, of course, 60 to 70% are women, smallholder farmers. And, and they are certainly interested in new developments and want to learn. And there was a, a deep desire to learn more about what these opportunities might be for them in the future. But I don't have data, I can quote it to you. Are there more questions? I have, well, okay, Professor Kulvarinka. Uh, I mean, I feel that this is actually a much more general problem than just with GMO. I'm, I fear that we live in a time where uh, other uh, anti-science movements are going up. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to chair a meeting in the parliament of this country about vaccination in two weeks' time. And there is a, a bunch of people who are claiming that vaccination is actually endangering your life. And uh, I'm, I must say, I'm really depressed by the failure of all of us to convey what science means, uh, what, how science is, is actually accumulating data and proving hypotheses. What do you think would be done better, could have been done better, uh, so that we, we have done our job better? Because we are quite clearly failing. I mean, we, we could uh, very, very well argue uh, among ourselves, but we are unable to convey uh, this argument to the public. What should be done better? I'm sure we can do it better. Uh, whether it would have a better effect would, remains to be seen. Um, in, in the UK, of course, we have spent a lot of time, a lot of effort on this particular issue. And it goes back a long way because the Royal Society was probably one of the first academies addressing some of these issues uh, that, that where, the, where there is a, a strong public component to consider. Uh, and, but that is no guarantee that the science is going to be accepted. Uh, so uh, you can imagine, for example, as I indicated, the number of studies that have been done on GM itself, not least in Europe by the European Commission, Yet these have not really broken a great deal of ground. It has become so quickly politicized. I suppose uh, one of the lessons we learn from this experience is that we have to get into the discussion at a very early stage. And we have to try to be representative of our views in a way that shows that we have sympathy for what the public are concerned about but that we do have answers to those questions. Now, there are occasions, unfortunately, when we do not have answers to the question. And that, of course, is exactly what caught us out in the UK with the mad cow disease, where there was uncertainty as about what, it, what the cause was, and there was a danger that scientists were going to say something that would actually not be at all helpful. Um, I, think, I think there are... Um, I have, a, I have a personal view of what's happened with the GM, which uh, um, I could perhaps share with you at this stage, and that is that uh, I used to be on the, uh, the uh, Jacques Delors, the president of the European Commission, way back in the 1990s, early, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, Anne McLaren, who was my predecessor at the Royal Society of the Foreign Secretary, I would go with Anne to this small group of people, which consisted of about 12 of us from all over Europe, who were supposed to give Jacques Delors information and advice about bioethical issues to do with biotechnology. The strongest voice in that group were the German Greens. That was the voice that dominated the discussion. And we had to spend a lot of time addressing their concern. And here comes the historical issue. And their concern, of course, derived from the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. 
But of course, you were not very successful, were you? Because you are so beautiful example of a kingdom. But if I remember, uh, Prince Charles is pretty against GM food, is he? How were you not able to convince him? Yes. But I must say that I know in Cambridge few astronomers who are against GM uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. stuff because of this. What you very objectively and nicely explained. I mean, in, in long term, 100 years, you know, so so one does not have quite clear arguments. But how is it with with Charles? He doesn't come to Royal Society, it's a Finnish Royal. <laughs> we haven't seen Prince Charles's letters on GM. You know, we esteem him. You, you remember, we love him because yes, we love him from Václav Havel because he supported very much the restoration of Prague yeah, yeah. Uh, Castle Gardens. Yes. He gave a lot of money for after, yes, no, after he, 89. He is a royal fellow and he is perfectly entitled to take part in every aspect of the Royal Society's meetings. And he does visit the Royal Society uh -huh. just occasionally. Uh -huh. uh, but the, 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 there is a, a debate uh, uh, with, with Charles on that matter, as there is on you know, science, for example. Uh, so it's not confined to GM. Uh, Prince Charles refers to it as grey goo. Uh, and uh, he has stimulated an enormous amount of discussion in those areas. But what is interesting, I think, about nano science, as I mentioned, that that is one area which seems to be progressing uh, reasonably well without any public uproar at the present time. And the same is true to a limited degree with synthetic biology. So it doesn't occur with everything, but it, it certainly mm -hmm. does occur with some. Do you know Martin, the name? You, you, you need to respond to that question, <laughs> I, I think. I agree what you said. Do you know the name of Peter Saunders? Sorry? Peter Saunders, do you know? Yeah. His, right. And his wife is Chinese. I understand that, uh, you know, I was in 68 when I came to London to Bonner's group in relativity group. He was relativist. And they both started, you know, uh, what's that? Journal, it's a journal written by them. It's a journal uh, against yeah. GM food. You see, so he became yeah. influential, yeah. not in relativity so much. Yeah. But, but I, but I st sorry, if I may sorry. Just, yes. if I just say, I, mean, I, I do want to go back to those figures that I showed of the number of farmers who are actually using the technology. Yeah, I'm not believing in it, that it would be dangerous, or they don't care. I would like to think they do care. Well, there is this famous joke about uh, the, how is Spotkova, hoop, uh, above the Niels Bohr gate, you know? He had a, what is, what, what, horse, horseshoe, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know this joke probably, no? I mean, they ask you, so rational man and scientist, how it is possible that you have here a horseshoe? And uh, the answer is, he said, well, you know, people say that it helps even if you don't believe in it. And that yes, was... But, <laughs> yes, but wait, wait a moment, wait a moment, because <laughs> let, let's go back to the farmers. I mean, the, fa the technology, as I said, has taken off more rapidly than any other agricultural technology. Now, if this was going to fail, or if it had negative side effects, or if it was going to kill people, sure. farmers would not use it. Oh, sure. No, 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 that's clear. Yeah. Yeah. I would still like uh, to return to your very interesting lecture uh, because you mentioned uh, a lot of ways how to improve the quality and quantity of crops and I would like to ask you what do you think about using various uh, fungi because it seems to me that fungi might also help a lot mostly if you consider also the lack of water and so on. Yes, yes, thank no, thank you. you. There are, there are a whole range of technologies of this type that are developing because people are interested uh, now. There's, there's a big growth, for example, in peri-urban gardens and developing food production within the confines of cities. And fungi are one possibility. There are others that are being investigated at the present time. I suspect with this idea of sustainable intensification, we're going to be looking at a whole range of new sources of nutrition uh, because of the pressure that will come and will not be provided, I suspect, by just 15 crops. In the 1960s and 70s, I was very much involved in the research and coordination of the production processes section 
of the International Biological Programme, which ran under the slogan, Biological Basis of Productivity and Human Welfare. And with one of the main outcomes of the uh, research on photosynthetic production of that time was that easiest to manipulate uh, is not the uh, net photosynthetic efficiency of the photosynthetic apparatus itself, because that's a rather conservative trait, but rather the size of the assimilation apparatus, its duration, and uh, that means maintenance for a longer time or shorter time, and, uh, of, and the um, allocation or uh, distribution of assimilates within a crop, within a plant. And uh, I wonder whether, what, what you think about the importance of two means by which you can achieve a longer leaf area duration. That means a better attenuate or a large, over, over, the, uh, over the run of the growing season, uh, a more efficient attenuation of the incoming photosynthetically active radiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, of course, any longer leaf area duration involves also a greater amount of transpired water, a higher total transpiration. That means that for this we need to uh, maintain sufficient water supply in the soil to the roots for a longer time or for the whole growing season. So that one of the means is to breed crops that will be tolerant even of temporary water logging and or even even uh, short-term flooding for the temperate zones. We have this crop for the tropics, that's paddy rice. And uh, what do you, I think that both agriculture, uh, agronomy and uh, um, genetics, that means a combination of conventional breeding and gene manipulation, should have this aim apart from breeding or uh, manipulating genes for resistance against such factors as pests or diseases. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, two responses. Number one, there is a great deal of interest in improving nitrogen fixation in plants that currently do not fix nitrogen, such as cereals. And one of our colleagues in the UK has recently uh, set up a spin-off company uh, looking at a, a new breakthrough that he's made, which may well lead to the possibility of getting away from this high use of fertilizer. And that's a really important direction to take. Of course, the other one which you touched on almost uh, has to do with improving the nutritional quality of the plant. And this example that is always used, of, and there are now many others, is the introduction of vitamin A, increasing vitamin A levels in rice and also the iron content. Both these would lead to an a decrease in infant mortality and a decrease in infant blindness. The science was completed in the year 2000 by our Swiss colleagues and it has still been blocked by Greenpeace. And the most recent uh, example was in the Philippines where the field trials, which are absolutely essential to be carried out, were ripped up by Greenpeace and so there was a complete block on the development of, uh, of uh, golden rice, as it's usually referred to. So the golden rice story is a tragic reflection on the way in which society treats quality science, which is being done for the good of humanity and for the, for the best of instincts and by the most careful technology. And uh, it's a sad note to end on, Chairman, but I'm afraid that's the reality of, the, of, of this particular topic. So I think that there are no further questions. So let us say to all three. <laughs>
because we have still programmed with the evening, but we had a completely informal discussion about the role of uh, various societies. We have here former presidents of academy, former uh, presidents of the Slavic society. Uh, I'm not sure whether it will be an informal discussion, but I think we should use the presence of uh, uh, our uh, guest here, a chief guest, and that Martin was so kind and said that he would say a few words about our society. So, if possible, and then perhaps uh, uh, Brian Heath, and uh, hopefully uh, it might be interesting what uh, also uh, Jeffrey uh, Bolton said, because he was uh, very important in the very smallish or small uh, Scottish uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh, but he's just giving an interview outside. So who wants to stay safe? It seems that there is more non-members of uh, <laughs> society than members, but it doesn't really matter. It will be just informal. Discussion, but perhaps you will sit here, Mark. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And we have also as a guest Heidi Hackman, who should tell us something about completely unknown <laughs> until now, before you became executive president organization.